<laughs> Simon. Um, this for anybody who's listening, this is Simon Cox, uh, and I'm Scott Park Phillips, and uh, he just finished a book, The Subtle Body: A Genealogy, and. Uh, I'm hoping this is the first in a series of interviews of people who lived on Mount Wudong. Um, Simon lived there for six years and yeah. then came off the mountain, learned how to speak seven languages and got a PhD. Am yeah. I right? Something like that. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's the glorified version of it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Good to meet you. Yeah, it's great to meet you too, man. I've uh, I've been hearing about you for years, um, from uh, Theo and uh, Daniel Moroz in Ottawa. So yeah, all good things, you know. Good, wow, good things about me. That's amazing. Um, yeah, man. <laughs> uh, uh, so so yeah, I mean, there was you're you're part of this whole cohort of of maybe six or seven people that I somehow have gotten to know over the years who all spent time on Mount Wudong. Yeah. That's actually a good place to start. Um, uh, just what was the training like? Like uh, the kind of like detailed, what did you train? Hmm. Um, yeah, so uh, I went out there in 2008 to take like a gap year between undergrad and grad school. Um, and, uh, you know, initially I was quite, um, kind of skeptical of what I'd find. Well, actually, I mean, my initial impetus, I wanted to move to Japan. I had a teacher there. I was studying the Bujinkan ninjutsu stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I finished college in 2008, right into the financial crisis. And so there were just no jobs around. Um, so I saved well, up a little bit of money. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> it forced me to steer my life in a more interesting direction, um, which kind of funny, I finished my PhD right into COVID. So similar thing happened again. Um, the prospect of conventional employment has constantly evaded me during my life, but it's made me live a more interesting life. So, so I'm thankful for oh, all yeah. of these. Uh, don't get yeah. a job. That's my advice. Don't just don't. Cool. Th thanks, Scott. Yeah. yeah, I'm 35 now, and I'm like, yeah, I think it's over. Thankfully, I have a, like a, a really talented wife who like can hold down jobs <laughs> uh, and really supportive family and stuff. But yeah, I mean, we're we're starting a business now and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, so I, I, it was just a gap year um, that I ended up uh, staying for about uh, six months in 08 into 09. And that's when Master Yuan was kind of, there was a pretty like tight group of us there. Um, and Master Yuan said he was gonna start this five-year program where he was gonna teach like the whole lineage uh, starting in September of 09. So um, I came back for that along with a bunch of my classmates um, yeah, and to give you a very detailed rundown, uh, we would wake up every morning at 445, I think, and go for a short run, just a, a few kilometers, uh, then come back and do Qigong for about an hour. Um, and then we would have breakfast. And then shortly after breakfast, our mid morning training would start, it would go from like uh, eight until 1130 or so in the morning. Um, and that was like uh, straight up Kung Fu basics stuff. So either stances or kicks, and then kind of Taolu, like forms after that. Did and then you do a lot of stretching too? Oh yeah, tons of stretching, yeah. So a little bit of stretching in the morning between the run and the Qigong, and then a lot of stretching before the mid-morning class. Just standard like uh, wushu stretches, um, lots of focus on chin to toe and getting your splits in order, and then like back bends and weird shoulder stretches and stuff. Um, that was hugely important. And what about held, held positions? Um, Muscularly so held positions. No, not so much. Yeah, it was very bouncy. Um, everything was very bouncy. Uh -huh. uh, so the whole curriculum was kind of geared toward like teenagers, basically. Because um, if you looked at like the Chinese students who were training at these schools, they were it was quite a uh, young um, kids. Uh, and so even though our class was older, we were all foreigners and. I was 21 when I started there, um, and the oldest guy in our class, I think he was 36. Um, so your body, the body of a 36-year-old, very different from the body of a 16-year-old, but we still trained in those kind of like methods geared toward like teenagers. Um, 
for better or for worse. <laughs> just, just so people know that the, the, the classic Chinese opera followed the Confucian model of seven to 14 was your hmm. intensive. And then you took on roles. Mm. Cool. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that, that certainly pertains uh, to what I saw there. Um, a lot of the Chinese students were kind of from our Sifu's home village and stuff. These were kids that, um, you know, were basically like uh, normal school kind of dropouts. Like they weren't, they couldn't really hack it in like reading books all the time, or they had like behavioral issues. And so their parents would send them to Wudong as like almost like a like military school to like whip them into shape. So it was this really funny kind of convergence of like, you know, like foreigners who had the the uh, kind of privilege uh, to, to kind of go over to China and study this stuff. And then like really kind of poor Chinese kids who couldn't really hack it in school, whose parents sent them there more or less against their will. <laughs> and so it was a really different kind of classes interacting um, at, at Sifu school. Um, so, yeah. I think um, that alternative form of education was actually quite common, but you have to, I, I would just, if we're, if we're gonna talk historically, which I, I'm very excited about doing, I think it, it would be fair to say that that would also be a privileged group that you could send them to, to a, a, a physical training school, whether, whether we wanna call this opera or village defense or you know, what, it, what, it's, or what its parallel was 150 years ago or 200 years ago. It was still had a, um, some kind of privileged status because otherwise it would have just gone straight to work. Yeah, yeah, no, th I mean, that is true, um, I guess, but like my brother, uh, Tai Zhao Wu, he, for example, he, um, he was from a family of like fruit sellers. Uh, like, they just sold bananas on the side. Oh yeah, so were... super wealthy, like uh, <laughs> merchant family from yeah. the 1820s. Like, yeah, yeah Ching <laughs> University graduates. Yeah. No, yeah. So, so yeah, like he he came to Wudong, and eventually he just couldn't take it anymore, the training and and the whole thing, and so he left and was worked selling fruit for a while, and he hated selling fruit more than he hated uh, training at the school. So then he kind of came back. Um, but you're right. I mean, like he did have the option of kind of because a lot of these people had kind of family connections to Sifu school. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you are right though. That I guess there is like a kind of modicum of privilege that they even had the option of uh, doing the kind of wushu school sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, um, the patronage network is still alive in China. It's nothing like it was when um, in the old days when money was unstable, mm -hmm. right? That dictated so much of social life when you couldn't rely on money. Um, right. You had to rely on these family connections and, and mm -hmm. wealth was actually, in most cases, mo for most people was measured on how good your connections were, your guanxi, mm -hmm. as it's mm -hmm. often called. Yeah, so are you referring to kind of like the hyperinflation of the late Qing dynasty, kind of like? I don't think there was any time in the Qing dynasty where money was particularly stable. It's interesting mm -hmm. if you look, there are periods in the Song and Ming, if we're going to not that I'm not an ec economics of China expert, but I just kept crashing into this issue. Mm -hmm. um, there are times, you know, when there, the, there's just there's so much wealth running around, mm -hmm. and they yeah. and and money seems fairly stable, you know, which you know, is a silver economy in both cases, mm -hmm. um, but also salt. But then, you know, it just got this is, it just wasn't stable enough and it would crash. And, you know, we look at those periods like, you know, a five year period where the economy was crashing and we think, oh, well, whatever, but like people didn't have food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it kind of sucked. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, certainly. I mean, yeah, certainly the, the kind of centrality of, of Guanxi and relationships has not, that's not gone away. Um, the Cultural Revolution did not root that out, <laughs> not one bit. Um, and yeah, so yeah, the kind of economics of the school these days is quite interesting because you have foreigners like like me and all my Kung Fu brothers coming in and spending what in Chinese context is like an exorbitant amount of money, but what from a kind of American context is like quite affordable. Um, and so our kind of tuition actually 
uh, kind of um, supplements or subsidizes the tuition of these students coming from the kind of more local contexts. Um, so, yeah. Um, so you're a pat patron student. That's also a classic, for, uh, you know, has its own formal um, yeah. history. So, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you get to 1130 and then do they feed you? Yeah, um, there were three meals a day through the school. Um, and again, this sort of Guanxi thing, the entire school infrastructure is run by Sifu's family. Um, his, uh, his wife has a number of sisters and his, all of his sisters-in-law are kind of just, they really make the whole place work and they're really good at it. They're just wonderful people to have around and everybody loves them. Um, and so, yeah, they're the cooks and they kind of coordinate the cleaning and everything of the school. Um, so yeah, we get a- clean? Did you clean? Yeah, we did. Um, we would clean, uh, yeah, I guess we cleaned every day technically, but we did like one big cleaning thing a week um, every Wednesday afternoon. Um, but I mean, we were in like an old, it was an old hotel, uh, sorry, an old hospital that was built on the temple grounds, kind of the temple was kind of like divided and like half of it became like a prison in the kind of Republican era. And then half of it was made into a hospital. And so we were in this like hospital built like, you know, in the early mid 20th century. Uh, and so cleaning it was like kind of a, a futile activity. Like it could not be cleaned. It just like, it was not a thing that could be cleaned. So we kind of, for me, the cleaning was always a bit of a symbolic thing. Like sure, I'll mop this floor, but it's gonna be just as dirty as before I mopped it. Um, so uh, and let's, let's stop that because for a minute, because it's pretty interesting. So. So we have this period right right after the Boxer Uprising, some before, but mostly right after, where they start closing temples. And there's, yeah. and you know, um, uh, gosh, what was the, the, the emperor's advisor? Uh, Yo, what was his name? But he came up with this slogan, um, you know, turn, turn schools, in, um, turn, sorry, turn temples into schools. Uh, mm. What's his name? I've forgotten. Peng, Peng Yo, something like that. Ah. He was deposed and he fled to Japan and he actually came to Mexico for a while in the United States. Cool. Yeah, pretty interesting character. I'll, I'll, his name will come to me later. But he, he, you know, it was his idea, but it didn't get carried out until really until 1912. Um, but they closed, the, the estimate now is a half a million temples. Wow. And so you're on, you're on the temple grounds or you're right outside the temple grounds and they have set up a prison and a, and a hospital there. Yeah, well, yeah they so we use the temple grounds for that, or they use actual temple buildings as well. Um, so the actual temple buildings were the prison, um, but I don't know whether they demolished because we the whole thing, both our dormitories, which were next to the temple, and the temple itself were part of the historical temple. The historical temple was like more than 10 times the size what the present day temple is. This is the temple Yushugong. It's the uh, one, it's kind of right there, right on the edge of the town of Wudangshan. And most it, easily the Yuan, there's a, the original Yuan temple gate is still there, right? Yeah, yeah. So that was actually the front of Yushugong. Um, uh -huh. But nowadays there's a huge street with stores and kind of noodle shops and stuff like that. And then you go through a temple and then you get to what is the temple. But historically that whole area was part of the, this temple. Uh, and it was like, it was the largest temple in Wudong by size and by personnel. It was the administrative center. It was run by like very powerful court eunuchs for most of its history. Um, and so, yeah, exactly. During this period when they were kind of like turning temples into schools, they turned this one into a prison uh, and then they built hospitals right next to it. Um, so, yeah, we were in the, we lived. So they in made it a hell realm, basically. They, they created <laughs> a hell realm there. Okay, cool. Yeah. They could torture yeah, they, people and stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, they did. And even even the kind of hospital was a bit of a hell realm, like our meditation yeah. room. Our meditation room was the former surgery room. So like the whole the floor was slanted into the middle and there was a drain and there were like blood grooves around the sides. Um, and so like that's where we meditated every day for years. And I was just like, what kind of horrible things transpired? Right here? Yeah. Oh, um, OK, wait, hang on. Yeah. Uh, uh, that image is too much, but this was a Christian hospital, I assume. That's a really good question. I, I don't know. Uh, would it have been? The doctors would have been Christians almost yeah. certainly, but you didn't have, if you went to a medical school, you didn't mm -hmm. have to convert to Christianity, but they were all Christian schools. 
Interesting. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. That's really cool. Yeah. So you get that little <laughs> addition to the story. Um, yeah. I mean, I would, one of the things I would, I presumably all that evidence of Christianity would have been gone. They would have torn it out. But mm -hmm. you, if you were really looking closely at the architecture, you, I, I would wonder you might be able to spot something. Um, but yeah, there was a kind of lattice pattern uh, in like concrete on the stairwells that um, it was circles and I think it had like crosses between the circles. Uh, so that that's that's really interesting, Scott. I'll, uh, they're going to they're going to demolish that those buildings any day now because Good. the government is expanding <laughs> the temple to its former glory. Um, cool. But uh, yeah, maybe. All right, I'll... we got to 1130. We got to lunch. Then what? uh yeah lunch um and so I'm, I'm telling you the kind of summer schedule we would we would flip some stuff around in winter um but we'd have lunch and then we'd take a long nap like a two-hour nap in the afternoon um and then uh for a lot of the program then we'd have a little class before dinner um like a, we'd have for a while we did like a hour of push hands every day um and then we'd have dinner and then we'd have oh no we'd have meditation in the afternoon in the summer too yeah we do an hour of meditation and an hour of push hands and then we'd have dinner and then we would have another like two to two and a half hour class in the evening from like say seven to nine thirty um and then and what bedtime was that, what was that training Simple that was all stretching it was and the, yeah it was the same as the mid-morning training so in the mid-morning for example we do stances as we do a bunch of stretching for you know 45 minutes then stances and then uh taolu um and sometimes uh, kind of depending we, you know, being there for six years, we went through a lot of curriculum. So there were whole periods when we just did like Sanda stuff and where we did a lot of fighting and whatever. Um, but, uh, and then in the evening we would do like kicks, for example, as basics, like very standard, like Gua Shu, Wu Shu kicks, you know, Northern stuff, the same exact thing you see at Shaolin basically. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we'd take a break and then we'd do Tao Lu and like Zan Zhuang and stuff like that. Um, and then, yeah, and then bedtime, yeah. So, um, well, so why why are the Wudong people more smooth than the Shaolin people? Like, do you have a quick answer for that? If the training is similar? Yeah, I mean, it's a cultivated aesthetic. Um, the whole this sort of like I had one of my Kung Fu brothers there, uh, Lewis, he, he actually had lived at Shaolin for like three or four years before he showed up at Wudong. Um, and he always struggled to get the Wudong kind of like the flavor of the movement, because in Shaolin, the movements are smaller, the stances are more narrow, and that's actually the movements themselves are like sharper and more precise, like you like stop on a dime, and the movement yeah. is over, and you move and you do the other one and stops. And in Wudong, yeah, there's this kind of like flowiness to it all. Um, it's kind of like dragony movement. And, and the, there are different kinds of uh, like Jin that we're cultivating through these things. Uh, Tang Jin is the long power, and that's hugely important. And then the kind of highest level of the long fist is our dragon form. And Sifu said like Long Xing Yo Tang Yo Shun. So it's like long and it's smooth. Um, so the whole thing, like once you learn the kind of basics, the kind of next level of a kind of technical expertise pertains to the cultivation of that is exact aesthetic that you're pointing out. It's this long and smooth kind of stuff, flowiness, you know, yeah. Um, jump, so it jumps and handstands. Mm -hmm. Did you do handstands, a lot of handstands? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I did a lot of handstand push-ups. Um, there's like a, movement in one of the highest level qigongs where you do a forward bend with your legs straight and then kind of slowly rise up into a handstand press um, press yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's called the qingting daoli the um qingting yeah is the uh, tombo uh i can't um light listening something what <laughs> it's the uh, dragonfly yeah it's the oh, dragonfly. Like dragonfly. Okay, yeah. dragonfly inversion i guess yeah um yeah and jumps tons of jumps we yeah very, a lot of jumps. Um, actually, uh, kind of, it's funny the kind of social hierarchies of the Kung Fu school, per, like 
centered around your flexibility and your ability to do jumps. Um, and I was like pretty flexible, but not like the most flexible, but I had like some of the best jumps around. And so it was very like, yes, I'm like the jumper, you know, felt very proud about it. Mm-hmm. And then I moved back to the States, <laughs> your jumper too? Well, I was, <laughs> I've got 20 years on you, so. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> jumping, jumping is a, 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 a diminishing returns. Um, <laughs> But yeah, but yeah, uh, you know my my hurricane, you know butterfly kicks were great mm. in their day. <laughs> yeah, that's great, man. Yeah, I'm, but yeah, I moved when then I moved back to the states and enter a PhD program, and no one gives a, like no one cares at all about how high you can jump. This is like completely irrelevant to anything, <laughs> you know, on a map. So good yeah. enough. Um, yeah. All right. So so that that's a good overview. Um, Oh, I, since we covered it, we might, what was the, what was the diet? Oh, it was like standard Chinese, like peasant food. Um, yeah, people would come to the school and they were looking for like Taoist things. Like I remember one time they served us five dishes at lunch and a guy was like, oh, it's the five elements. And I was like, no, this is just like cheap cabbage. Uh, lotus, lotus root was really cheap actually where we were because it all comes from Hubei. But I, I didn't realize it was like a delicacy in most of China. And so we were always like, oh, God, lotus root again. Um, so <laughs> it was predominantly vegetarian, uh, but we did have a lot of like uh, egg and tomato. That was like a standby. That was kind of a treasured dish in the school. Um, and then we'd have like a little kind of like uh, green vegetables with like little tiny scraps of pork or something like that. Um, what about spice? Um, in the, the, the food at the school, there was no spice no at spice. all. Okay. Yeah. Um, Plenty of garlic, though. Uh, we didn't, they didn't like care about any prohibitions pertaining to garlic or, or leeks. Five um, onions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Onions, yeah. Lots of that. Um, um, cool. Yeah. All right. Well, all right. We got that. We got that out of the way. Six years of that. But you also, during that period, you got uh, the meditation transition from something very simple into something more golden elixir specific yeah Mm -hmm. um do you want it do you want to summarize that in some way or or just maybe the you know give it some dimension some time dimension or yeah um so yeah the meditation tradition was something that um attracted me to wudang it sounded really cool i read my friend dave dave white do you know dave dave white bay area Okay. Well, he, he was in there. He was in Wudong like 05 and 06. Oh, big way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. He had these great blogs uh, and he, he's, he's a very gifted writer, Dave. And um, he uh, kind of, uh, he wrote a lot about the meditation that they do there and how cool it was to just like, you just go and you sit for an hour. Um, and there's not like, there's not an option to sit for 15 minutes. Uh, you just sit for an hour and you kind of do your best. Um, and how great that was. And so, yeah, that, that's, you know, we show up and Sifu showed us how to sit, the basic seated posture, and taught us like a super basic kind of Chinese energetic anatomy, like uh, like a 45 second rundown, basically. Um, and then uh, he didn't teach us anything else for like three years. <laughs> so, the whole right there. So, what is the seated, seated posture? Legs crossed or? Uh, it's the mod- modified Burmese posture um, is how they do it. The, uh, um, so for men, it's like the left foot goes on the inside and then the right kind of goes like this. Oh, okay. Yeah. You sit like that and then you do the Taiji knot like uh-huh. that. And for women, it's all reversed. Yep. Um, and then it's just back straight. We sit up on like a cushion um, and uh, yeah, and just focus like on your Dantian uh-huh. um, and breathe through your nose kind of uh, slowly, long, even, um, thin uh, breath. Um, like the silk spinner and the jade carver? Did he say that? Uh, no, no, what are those? Yeah, yeah, well, the silk spinner, right, is, is smooth and continuous. Mm, right? okay. you pull suddenly, it breaks. Yeah. Or you do a sudden turnaround, it breaks. The mm. jade carver leaves no scratches, but also mm. the jade carver, um, like the beginning jade carver is like, I'm going to carve a penguin, you know, but mm-hmm. the advanced jade carver, and you can go to the palace museum in Taiwan and, and see these exquisite works. The advanced jade carver just looks at it and starts carving and 
tries to see what's there, you know, mm -hmm. and like the most famous piece of jade ever carved, he was working and he got a Napa cabbage. Like, oh, uh -huh. like whoa, yeah. look what's <laughs> here, you know. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so that's, you know, an image of the, of, of self-discovery. Oh, cool. I like that. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That was very much, that's very much aligned with Sifu's whole, um, kind of ethos. Like the whole thing was like, this is the physical posture you do just sit and meditate. It's like you, you basically just start interacting with your body and you kind of see what's there and figure out what to do. Um, so yeah, like years down the line, he starts teaching us basic like circulation stuff. Um, but uh, it was all very, he was very like super empirically focused. Like he, he was really wary of providing us with like too much theoretical overlay that would kind of overwrite our own experience of this stuff. Um, kind of infuriatingly so at the time, like we're, we're like his disciples were just like, Sifu, tell us what to do, give us these secrets or whatever. And he was uh, like, no, like you, you find it yourself, basically. You know? OK, yeah. so then after three years, you got some instruction. Yeah, um, so we would do meditation retreats. We started with kind of three day ones and then worked up to five day and then I think seven day um, where we wouldn't eat any food and we prepared these like herb balls and we just eat the herb balls and stuff. With sesame? Um, Sorry? With sesame? Did you use uh, sesame as an ingredient? There was, there was no sesame in them. No, there were like 50 ingredients. Um, Whoa. So, if you actually wouldn't medicine balls. Yeah, yeah, med yeah, like uh, Chulen kind of stuff in Tibetan traditions. Um, but yeah, there were like seven different varieties of ginseng. Um, Whoa. And uh, just a huge portion of like the Chinese pharmacopoeia. Sifu wouldn't give us the recipe, but, but we, we were responsible. We were the ones who dried the herbs. So like he bought this massive amount of herbs and then we had to take them out in the morning and like leave them in the sun and then kind of take, roll them up and take them in at night. Um, so, you know, I was such a good disciple that I didn't just like take pictures and then try to reconstruct it all myself, but I kind of regret not doing that. I think Theo took pictures though. So uh -huh. maybe like with Theo, we can like Reconstruct. Yeah. Anyway, Sifu said he would eventually give us the recipe, but he was gonna like divide it between like multiples of us. So, so like, you have to like, stay together. So you have to yeah. cooperate. Yeah. yeah. Classic. Yeah. So anyway, um, in in the context of these retreats, that's when Sifu actually started as teaching what you might think of as a golden elixir um, stuff. Uh, because prior to that, it was all just focused on your Dante. It was kind of like contentless meditation that we got really good at. It became really like a very nourishing practice for all of us. We all, I, I can't say we all loved it, but, but most of us really loved meditation. Um, even though there was not really nothing to it, uh, like content wise. Um, but you were so, yeah. standing meditation in the evenings too, in various postures. Were you standing for long periods of time or, or short? What? Um, like a standard standing session was about half an hour, but there were a couple times when Sifu made us go for like two and a half hours or something like that. Um, I did which, six once. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that. that was the Olympics. That was the meditation <laughs> Olympics. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Anything more than two hours is a little absurd. Yeah. I felt like even, I mean, you know, you go through like uh, waves. So like if you're standing there for that long, you have, Sometimes you're just like, this is amazing. And then you'll kind of get distracted and thinking about <laughs> crazy things. And then, and then you're like, oh yeah, this is great. I'm so glad I stood this long. And then, so yeah. Um, so uh, I actually have this rubric you might be interested in. I just taught it this morning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's like, so you have a quadrant, right? And so uh -huh. in one quadrant is normal athletics, which is active mind, active body. Mm -hmm. And then you have your classic Shaolin model, which is active body, quiet mind. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then you have meditation, which is quiet body, quiet mind. Mm -hmm. And then you have the internal martial arts, and I would say the golden elixir too, which is um, quiet body, active mind. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I dig it. <laughs> well, it's just a cool, like, you know, thing, like way to, way to organize the world. Um, no, for sure. Yeah, that's a very useful, uh, I think, analytic framework, maybe for doing kind of comparative work between different traditions, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So have you seen Shen Zhen's comparative stuff? A lot of the science-y Buddhists are using that stuff. 
No, I'm not familiar with this. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's a, that's a major detour, but he's got all <laughs> these symbols for the different types of meditation. It's very organized. So the, the scientists were like, who were like trying to study Buddhism were like, oh man, we can do that <laughs> and then we can measure it, you know? Oh yeah, okay, cool. Um, so, all right, so what I, I, we got plenty of time. We got, we just, we just covered that. That was great. So maybe a little bit about, uh, you are the historian person. And I would actually kind of like to get to the disheveled section where we go anywhere we want, but, but since I've got you here, and it is a source of major controversy, um, the best book I've seen in English on Wudong is um, Paul Katz's book. Familiar with it? The the uh, I don't think so. What's, the, what's that? What's it? What's it called? Uh, I should run and get it. Anyway, Paul Katz, something of the immortals. Uh -huh. Images of the immortals, I think it's called, and huh. the. He, uh, the sort of, you know, the center of his project was looking at these murals that all survived on Mount Wudan mm -hmm. um, and contextualizing them. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. But cool. the whole thing is like, you know, he really tries to explain um, what Wudang was. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so I could jump in here, but I haven't, I, it's been a while since I read it. I could like try to do my own little history. But mm -hmm. maybe you could do a simple background of what Wudong is and then what happened to it. And then, you know, in a historical sense, pointing to the major disjunctures, actually, is what. Hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you do that? Um, yeah, that's kind Can of tall. Well, I'll help. I'll help. <laughs> we'll just go back and forth a little bit. So yeah. it starts with this, the, the, the leader of the the eight immortals meeting with the um, Genghis Khan and out in the open field or something, replicating earlier Taoist uh, Zhang Da Ling meeting Cao Cao in the open field. Mm -hmm. And you get this, you know, agreement that um, he's going to back Chuan Zhen, um, mm -hmm. this new invention, this new innovation of monastic Taoism. And um, Taizu Emperor, I forget which one, one of the Ming emperors gets, you know, well, because actually they all had some interaction with Xuan Wu. Mm -hmm. And at the founding of the dynasty, they they go, uh, the, the, the Tian Shi at, at Mount Lukushan, it was actually asked to promote Zhan Wu to the highest seat, uh, mm -hmm. the, the Taoist um, uh, heavenly hierarchy. And he went into retreat for nine years. He said, it's going to take a while. I don't know if I can pull this off. He went into <laughs> retreat for nine years. He came out. There were rainbows everywhere. He's like, I did it. He's agreed to sit in this posture of meditation, you know, with his legs in bare feet on, an, on, a, on a turtle and a snake, like ready to go, but yeah. not moving. And, and so uh, there's a lot more to that story. But that's then this, his, his primary seat then becomes Wudangsha. Mm -hmm. And they build a temple there. And the oldest temple, I guess the oldest temple gate is, is what's called a, um, a pass-through temple. So there's a, a tunnel under it, and they would have mm -hmm. theater on top. So when you enter the temple for festivals, there'd be a performance going on. And you'd go, you'd pass you know, through the death gate, as it were, into the huh. other realm. Just, mm -hmm. just like the film Spirited Away. Yeah, that's which temple is that one? You know, there's a great book about death that outlines this, and I've forgotten the name of that specific temple. It's called the Temple Gate. Yeah, um, but it's it, it's this, it's not the front one. I think it's the second one in on the uh -huh. main road. Oh, interesting. Oh, okay. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I mean, because like according to the local kind of mytho history. Wulonggong, the Five Dragons Temple, which is quite remote, uh, is like the oldest temple. The first temple it was built in the kind of like by the second emperor of the Tang Dynasty. Um, but I can't picture anywhere. Oh, that was that old. Oh, but it wasn't called Wudong then yet, right? No, oh, no, I don't think it was. No, it was. That was a kind of. It was part of like a rain, uh, rain making mission. Like the emperor Li Shimin, he sent a kind of 
like a, a wizard out to go and kind of like find some dragons to bring to stop like a, a massive drought that was hitting China. And they stopped and, you know, they, they, they kind of the rainmakers would do their things on like mountain peaks and stuff. And they did this one ceremony on Wulongding, the, the five dragons peak. Um, and yeah, this is in the kind of uh, mid or uh, early mid seventh century CE. And they saw five dragons circling in the sky and then they, they brought all the rain. And so that's where they built the first kind of temple. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, it was it a dragon temple. It was a, it was a temple to the dragon kings initially. Then. Yeah, yeah. Um, so nowadays, if you go, it's a it's Junwu Dian. It's a it's a temple to Junwu. Um, but back then, it, it was a temple to the dragons. And there's still like an old kind of a, like mud brick structure on Five Dragons Peak that they say is like the the um, Tang Dynasty temple. I'm not sure if that's true or not. Um, but it looks old and decrepit, and it's really cool. And uh, that's a super cool temple. Um, I think they're building like uh, cable cars to it now, so it's much more easily accessible. But uh, it was like one of the least accessible temples, even while I was in Wudong, it was like a real pain in the ass to get to. Just just a, a, a note for anybody listening to this. Um, I did an interview with uh, Hannibal Taub, who has took photographs of murals all over across the north of China. And he explains the whole cosmology of the dragons on the mountains and, mm -hmm. and Jun Wu at the back of every village across the whole north wow. uh, as a structure for building a, a, a fortified city. Mm -hmm. um, so this, this is the, this, what, if people have already seen that or want to go back and look at that, it's three hours long, which is really good. Um, but awesome. what you just described was the fortification, the Ming concept of fortification or early Ming concept of fortification of the whole country. So mm -hmm. in a sense, Zhen Wu is watching over the North. So mm -hmm. in case there's another invasion from the North, it becomes, it's right. stopped. Mm -hmm. How are yeah. you going? <laughs> I thought we were going to start in the base, but this is great. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, yeah. So th th that's the kind of um, local mytho history starts with Li Shimin, the second emperor of the Tang dynasty, seventh century. But actually, like archaeological excavation at Wudang has shown that people have been doing weird things on the mountain peaks there since like deep into the Neolithic. Sure. Um, so there's one of these interesting places where like the mytho history doesn't go back nearly as far as what appears to us to be the, you know, fact the actual archaeological history. Um, so, I mean, it's just, it's a wild place and it's full of like really cool, like natural grotto caves that form in the sides of the mountains. So yeah, it's, it's no wonder that, that people have been hanging out there forever. Um, and the kind of, the, the kind of, uh, major figure in our in the kind of revival of this Wudong stuff in the 1980s, Guo Gaoyi talked about how historically mountains were where people would go during periods of kind of um, civil chaos. Uh, so again, it makes sense is, you know, when things are really bad in the country, you kind of flee into the mountains to get away. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, that, that same, because Hubei is an extremely mountainous and quite inaccessible province, which is, and it's it's uh, like totally landlocked, except it has the, the Yangtze River kind of flows through Wuhan. Um, and so uh, that's why it's remained kind of quite, quite poor as far as uh, kind of inner China is concerned. Um, and it's where Mao built the like Chinese automotive industry in the kind of late 60s and early 70s, because it's like super far inside China. So because he was worried about their kind of it, their automotive infrastructure being bombed by the Soviets or by the Americans. And this is like so far inside, it's like totally inaccessible. But that's also kind of hamstrung the Chinese automotive industry because it's a total pain to get materials in and cars out. Um, and you <laughs> so need water. water, you need water for steel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, the Yangtze does go uh, kind of near this uh, where we were. Um, Wuhan so is what, 200 miles south of? Yeah, that sounds about right, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so the city uh, an hour away from us or 90 minutes was Shiyan, which is like kind of like the Detroit of China. Um, and Dongfeng Industries stretches like 2,000 kilometers of just factories. Um, and I, I taught Taiji actually to like the son of a provincial official who was like, oh yeah, there's this automotive industry, but that's actually just a cover for massive nuclear infrastructure. So like there are just nuclear silos and tunnels all under the Wudong area. Um, so it's just, it has this really... It's just extraordinarily strange place. Um, you got the nuclear stuff, you got the automotive industry, and then you have these whole these temples with this with really really strange histories of their own. 
Um, so, yeah. Okay, um, okay. So go back. Yeah. Remind you back to like. So, um, do you have a sense of what the role of the temple was in Chinese society? Say, let's just start mid Ming to mid, say before the uh, Taiping. Yeah. Um, I I I would definitely defer to you in <laughs> in um <laughs> in that question. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that that that's okay. I mean, I I mean, I, it's it's on my part, it's largely speculative because I, you know it's this interesting thing where where Chuanzhen is a kind of uh, almost a Buddhist accommodation. You know, mm -hmm. like you could think of of of. Taoism as splitting and Buddhism as splitting yeah. you know, to these sort of more Buddhist and more Taoist versions of each other that mm -hmm. are kind of competing. Um, so, you know, so Zen is like, so, you know, Shaolin is like a Taoist version of Buddhism or something, right? Mm -hmm. And then Chuan Zhen is a Buddhist version of Taoism or something, you know, but not exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of very Chinese to do that kind of yin yang thing, you know, where they're kind of like inside of each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I mean, I, I think, I think one of the most interesting questions is how many, like, how important was it as a site for uh, orphans? You know, because there's always throughout history so many orphans and. Um, you know, were, were a lot of people going to Wudong as children? Mm -hmm. um, do you have a sense of that? Um, well, I mean, so this is the weird thing. Uh, when I was there, I, um, I was kind of like participant observer. I, I was kind of engaging the practices and trying to kind of embrace the whole world. But at the same time, there was a part of me, I had like a, a modicum of academic training. So I tried to retain like in a kind of ethnographic uh, kind of suspension yeah. of judgment. And so the things I saw in Wudong, um, if I'm being like an, a responsible historian ethnographer, uh, only really pertain to the Wudong of 2008 to 2014. Um, like I saw things there and they were like, this is how it's always been. This is the tradition. Um, and that's a kind of interesting rhetorical stance that I, more than often I was willing to believe it. I was like, yeah, that's a totally reasonable thing that this is kind of how things have always gone here. But at the end of the day, um, I can't really make judgments outside of the kind of historical time in which I was observing what was going on. Well, but, I, um, under, I understand that position. I mean, it's, and it's a reasonable position to say, you know, you show up with the anthropologist mind and you're mm -hmm. like, let's take these people's story about who they are seriously. Because yeah. for, for whatever reason, they, they are telling this story and it has meaning. And it's, it's actually the best, you know, as Clifford Gertz said, it's actually the best we can do. Yeah. But on the other hand, it's China. Mm -hmm. And we and the West have been interacting with China, since, you know, for 500 years, at least. You mm -hmm. can go back to Roman times, depending on who you think we are. But mm -hmm. um, it it's also um uh they've been writing about their own history yeah. um, so we can say a lot of things like like for instance we could we can certainly say a lot about the republican era and these junctures but mm -hmm. one thing i'm i'm doing the show uh, on friday actually in uh, massachusetts and one of the um one of the things I get to say is that, you know, the Kung Fu movie thing exploded after Xiang Kai Ren, uh, who is a Bagua Zhang teacher, um, came up with this idea, right? So the Boxer Rebellion happens, the martial arts, theater, religion is just combined. And then the Boxer Rebellion happens, they're like, we got to get rid of all that stuff. And, and then they're like, no, maybe we can keep it if we can separate them, right? So you get this very yeah. secular version of theater, you get this very secular version of of a religion that looks more like the YMCA and they're just like trying to organize like, mm -hmm. you know, a fundraiser like the Red Cross and, and then, you know, it's called the Red, Red Swastika. And then mm -hmm. you get, you know, this thing called pure martial arts. And mm -hmm. Shankai Ren as a teacher obviously wasn't satisfied with that. He's like, well, can we put the theater back in if mm -hmm. we make all the religion fantasy? Mm -hmm. So we started writing these fantasy stories of 
the gods oh. fighting, right? Yeah. And there were 230 films made in the 1920s, none of which survived. Wow, cool. And they were all kung fu. I mean, they made way more movies than that, actually. They just exploded in China. But it, these were the kung fu movies. Mm -hmm. and, and then they banned them. And, you know, and it, it fled outside the reach of the Republican government to Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we have Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee and all of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but one of the films that rhetorically speaking and the, the argument for why we should shut down this industry, we should shut down this industry was the film about the job. Mm. Yeah. And, and the story was that people were jumping out of their seats and like kowtowing to the God on the screen and then burning <laughs> incense. And they're like, well, we just closed half a million temples and people are, now they're turning our movie theaters into temples. You know, we're, we're gonna have to stop this. And by the way, people keep running off to Mount Wudong to study Kung Fu. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, right? that, was, that was the rhetorical argument in the newspapers as it were in the government that, that triggered the, the nationalists to ban Kung Fu movies. Wow. Cool, man. <laughs> yeah, that's, my, that's my exciting story. But, but do you have, did you have any sense? Was there any lore about this? Like, because that would be the time when, say, Tai Chi, like Yang style Tai Chi, made it to Wudong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, um, the actual, like, yeah, everything I heard about kind of like pre-Cultural Revolution Wudong was very uh, shrouded in kind of um, mystique. Um, it just, it seemed like very Kung Fu movie-ish sort of stuff to me. So, I mean, there is historical stuff. We know historical figures who, and there are like a couple styles that we know that people actually practiced kind of in that era. Um but for the most part, I mean, the Chinese, like the kind of consciousness of Wudong was really like pretty profoundly shattered um, in the kind of periods of agricultural collectivization and the cultural revolution in the 50s and 60s into the 70s. Um, and so a lot of this stuff was really um, about, yeah, just reconstructing um, and kind of uh, obviating the missed generations um, that the kind of wild 20th century uh, created. Um, so yeah, like as far as like Taiji in Wudong, this, yeah, this is a really interesting historical issue. Um, because yeah, morphologically, the 108 form we do is quite similar to Yang style. Um, and of course you go to Wudong and they're like, oh yeah, you know, Yang came from Wudong. <laughs> and you talk to Yang stylists, they're like, oh yeah, you know, Wudong, they just copied Yang style. Um, but I mean, my intuition is it's probably much more interesting than either of those positions, uh, would allow. Um, and uh, and there's this weird thing, the one, the thirteen in our lineage, that's its own kind of thing. Um, but our grandmaster has expressed like his own skepticism at the antiquity of that. Like um, my my friend Jeff is uh, um, did some really great interviews with uh, our grandmaster Zhong Yunlong and Sifu Yuan Xiaogang uh, back in 2016, I think. Um, extended interviews where he got uh, just a ton of information, and he asked very. Um, very clear-sighted historical questions. So this is the sort of thing people would they don't want to talk about history. Um, they're uh, people would rather leave it in the kind of uh, mystery mystical zone. <laughs> so it's a bit uncomfortable to like push people on historical questions. Um, but I I just I did that. You know, if you're if you're a foreigner, you're you're just a crazy foreigner who doesn't understand like the mores of Chinese society. You can actually get away with quite a lot. Um, so yeah, I asked a lot of historical questions. And as you can tell from my website, I, I really kind of did my best to kind of reconstruct the, uh, the history of this stuff. Um, but uh, Jeff, so Jeff is kind of uh, putting all that information into a book and that will be come out uh, hopefully soon. And that will be like the seminal volume on kind of our lineage and where this stuff comes from. Um, and it's really fascinating story. Um, but uh, so yeah, the, um, on the question of Taiji coming to Wudong, there wasn't uh, a lot of um, consciousness about this stuff. Uh, like our Taiji lineages, according to the kind of emic perspective, the tradition actually comes from uh, Lushan in, in Liaoning province, Wu Lushan. So it's not the Southern Lushan full of like evil sorcerers. It's the Northern Lushan um, 
uh, where the kind of home province of the historical figure who's been associated with Zhang Sanfeng and Wudang, this guy Zhang Junbao, uh, was from. Um, so uh, that's where kind of the master Guo Gaoyi, he learned all of, pretty most of the Kung Fu in our lineage came from Liaoning province, where he learned it was in a, this different Sanfeng Pai up there, the Sanfeng Tsuran Pai. Um, and then he kind of brought it back to Wudong uh, kind of in the 80s, but his old master from Wulushan had died. Um, so he, his master was like, if I die, go become a disciple of this guy, Tang Chong Liang, who was in Wudong. So he became Tang's disciple, but Tang was Longmen Pai, Dragon Gate. And so it was kind of like bad form for Guo Gao Yi to identify as Sanfeng Pai and stuff like that. So he taught all the Sanfeng Pai stuff to our grandmaster, but he wouldn't hand, he wouldn't give him the official lineage. So our grandmaster found another guy in Wudong who was from an old Wudong Sanfeng Pai. Um, it's a bit of a convoluted story. Okay, yeah, but that, that sounds right. So, 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 uh, Zura, so it was a Zuran. <laughs> Yeah. So you know there is there was one in in Beijing. There was a Zuran, uh, 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 they call it a Lan, uh, uh, Lanquan, like lazy fist. Oh, cool. Lanquan said so it's also a Jiangsan Feng lineage that somehow survived in, in Beijing. I don't know, or around huh. there. That's going to yeah. be published by um, uh, uh, Favar. Uh, what's his name? Um, George, George Favar uh, is an anthropologist in, uh, cool. in, in Marseille okay. area. Uh, okay. He's supposedly going to publish on that eventually, in, probably in French, but you read French though. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty cool. Um, all right, so that's that's good. That's a good story. So and that that mountain might have been able to stay out of some of the warlordism and stuff, right? There's sort of a possibility that during the early 20th century it was fairly secluded could be <laughs> i don't know <laughs> um yeah I, I really want to go take a trip because there's a really old jiang san feng temple on that mountain with like a golden statue of him and everything uh so yeah i'd love to see it and there's all these local kind of like jiang san feng spots uh and so yeah it's, it's not a place people often associate with him but he was really huge up there um, and whether there's an historical connection or whether he was, again, one of just a kind of like a figure that was channeled as he was like out in Chengdu in the kind of mid 19th century. Um, uh, another, you know, mysterious thing about doing kind of Chinese historiography is like, is this an historical person or is this person being channeled through a circle of, uh, you know, planchette writing people? <laughs> yeah, well, let's hold back. We, we can dive. <laughs> we'll dive into John Song Fung in a minute. Okay. But, I, but, <laughs> okay. but, I, but, I, but the, the fact that there, there are these actual lineages is pretty significant, I think, in understanding what, you know, what it was you got and and it's hard it's still hard to figure out what it was for you know mm -hmm. in, in that context because it's very close to opera um as a as a training routine um and it there isn't there isn't obviously a militia connection here although maybe there is like mm -hmm. maybe these are like batteries like mm -hmm. in a sense for the energy to be cultivated that can then go out, you know, especially thunder gods, right? Which Zhang Wu in a sense, it's also a commander of the thunder gods and, and, and they control the dragons are closely related. They are thunder and lightning. So, you know, right. maybe the idea was that this would filter out to, to militias mm -hmm. and, and, and that we have, you know, if you think of a structure like that, a historical structure that might make sense, but it's, it's tough because when you have different kinds of government, right? You have you have you have, you have Song, you have Yuan, you have you have Ming, and mm -hmm. then you have Qing, and these are all different, like ethnic, you yeah. know, um, uh, um, uh, what would we call it? Uh, alliances, mm -hmm. different kinds of ethnic alliances, and that had different. Each of them had different relationships to, you know, um, the, to local power sources so gentry organized militia or or even um you have the these um uh, garrison towns right which were which were ethnically muslim often um that in the tang dynasty were all horse you know <laughs> they got this became but they were eat right up to the end of the Qing dynasty those were separate governments um mm -hmm. or functioned as separate local governments so you know like what 
what's Wudong's relationship to all that is sortable. I think it's sortable, but we're missing some key information. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it sounds like you're, you're much more familiar. Like you need to engage these like minute sources when you're going back into like, you know, Ching and preaching stuff. And uh, yeah, Wudong, it just becomes like this black hole, like pre-1911, basically. That, that's kind of my experience of trying to like delve into the history of like what the hell was going on in this place and uh so th that's where i just like i kind of take my ethnographic suspension of belief and i just project everything that i see right now back into the past and i'm like how much of this stuff actually makes sense if it was if it's always been this way and it actually lines up really well like and the way that that our grandmaster describes like old wudong like it was a it was like the wild west like there were tons of lineages and everyone was like weaving in and out of all these different lineages you had Zengi and Trenzan on the same mountain like in the same temples like like none of it <laughs> none of it really mattered and everyone was doing all these different things and like the preponderance of thunder deities in Wudong is like exceptional there's some there's one of my favorite shrine in Wudong is like Leisha and the the thunder he's like a blue bird um and it's like uh, on this little cliff it's kind of tucked away and there's like a natural pond inside the cave and it's like just so cool if there's it's always floating in a cloud um and yeah like the uh, kind of um the 19th century master who preceded shu ben san as like the abbot of purple cloud palace in the kind of early to mid early to mid 1800s he was like thunder rights was his thing um so thunder rights and alchemy um and all of this stuff is just like cooked in and it seems like there was a pretty um chaotic kind of milieu basically um and that if you go today and there's like a handful of like big lineages that like have you know figures established with them and they're like it's that lineage and you can get that certification and learn all of this stuff that's like very new uh that's what at least that that's what grandmaster zong says and that that makes sense to me um so yeah so certification so it's interesting just to like back out a second so you starting in, in the tongue but but mainly in the song um you get um uh uh not certification the word is used is uh ordination yeah, yeah. um mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. registers um at 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 uh Lunghushan, at the um you know dragon tiger mountain mm -hmm. and that is that becomes the political center of Taoism. Mm -hmm. And they um, do uh, ordinations um, for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a couple of times where it gets pulled out somewhere else. It's like they keep doing it at Maoshan, for instance. They keep mm -hmm. doing them. They, you could, you, they'll send you there for certain things. But eventually, most of the ordination was happening at Lunghushan. But of course, mm -hmm. the relationship there between Zhan, Zhuan Zhen and Zhang Yi, Zhuan Zhen being you know, a perfect realization or however you want to translate it, which is the center was technically either uh, in Beijing or on Mount Wudang, um, depending on that moment in history. But, you know, so, but, but I think that, so it's a little bit weird, like there was a little bit of a power struggle there, but basically the, the tensure, the head um, lineage at, um, at Lumushan would tour the country and do these ordinations for all these different lineages, for many, many, many different lineages, um, and 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 do canonizations for deities uh, so that they were became orthodox, it's like mm -hmm. they're following a set of rules. So it's like, I and mean, I'm sure they were going to Wudong. I mean, I'm actually not sure, but um, it makes sense that they would have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and so there's a lot more back and forth. And mm -hmm. we realized, and there was a lot more centralization, but the thing is you could be ordained like very simply um, as a way of just joining, but mm -hmm. your actual, everything you learned was completely local. Yeah. And then you would just be, you would declare your connection, but five generations might go by before anybody went back to Lungushan. So, it, you know, but that's kind of what it meant to be Taoist was to be part of this network. Yeah, yeah. Well, really cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, uh, I was at a conference once and the kind of scholar of Taoism, Arizona State University, Stephen Bogenkamp, he wrote yeah. the kind of early Taoist scriptures. Um, he made this remark that like, without the kind of uh, periodic efforts of the central government bureaucracy, 
um, at like kind of bringing Taoism together, there would be no like no Taoist tradition to speak of. Um, and I always thought that was like Taoism, it has this kind of centripetal force. And so things like ordination um, and the kind of like organized structures of monasticism, these were imported from from Buddhism, you know, these weren't necessarily like native uh, Taoist things. Um, so if, if you ever see like lots of organization in certain dimension of Taoism, like it's a pretty good bet that they're actually like just copying the kind of like Buddhist ground game, um, which they had really good reasons to because, you know, the Buddhists had all these great uh, like tax tax breaks and stuff like that for their temples that they engineered that would periodically like in the in the mid uh, Tang, the Hui Chang suppression, they were like all tax exemptions for Buddhists are gone, you know, but like um, then they'd kind of sneak back in later. So the Taoists, Taoists kind of as a, a, you know, maybe from like a social Darwinist perspective or something had to, you know, engage in these same sort of games to kind of compete with the, the proliferation of Buddhism in China. Well, it's, it's true. Well, I mean, the, the way I would put it is that Buddhism had so many advantages. Yeah. Religion. Uh, one mm -hmm. that they could proselytize, whereas Taoists didn't do that, right? Mm -hmm. And and, mm -hmm. um, and you could and the whole idea of training centers, right, which was way more of a local thing. But there mm -hmm. were, but it's a mistake, and I, I think Bogan Camp has actually retracted some of that material because it it an uh, awful lot of what he thought was Buddhism can really be attributed to early celestial master. Maybe it wasn't called that, but the sort of lineages of, that trace themselves to Zhang Gaoling mm -hmm. um, were creating ordina ordination structures. Mm -hmm. we, and of course, but, but you, can, you, could never, you could never definitively say um, that, that there wasn't Buddhist influence because it's, people have even argued that Zhuangzi is influenced by Buddhism. You know, we're talking three, 400 years earlier i mean so that's a that's a that doesn't actually work as an argument anyway because it gets it's just yeah. like when does the influence start or stop but mm -hmm. but um but what i want to say is that is that yeah this this in the sung dynasty this very distinctly taoist institution is created because because buddhists aren't really interested in canonization they're not mm -hmm. really interested in changing their, their cosmology. Mm -hmm. um, Taoists are imitating it in ritual for sure, but they're mm -hmm. also innovating it and creating completely new ways of organizing cosmology, um, which then the Buddhists come, right? You know, like that's happening. Um, so, so uh, but what I always say is um, Lukashan is completely destroyed, like demolished and occupied by the communist army in the 1930s yeah um so that like just ends um so anything after that was free floating and then and i thought maybe before we jump into johnson fung um although we could go almost anywhere here i kind of want to talk about homer but um <laughs> we might need another meeting um uh did you in terms of stories because this is one of those things, like I would say about my teachers, like my my um, my second, really my second teacher, uh, George Shu Shu um, When he came over, he came over in like seventy nine. I started studying with him in the late eighties. Mm -hmm. um, he had no contact, right? He had his grandparents. Yeah. Um, who had escaped, um, his grandfather was ship captain and the communist takeover was declared and he just turned the ship around and under uh, MacArthur, MacArthur, he, um, he uh, you know, brought his ship to America and got amnesty. Oh. And, oh. and yeah. so, yeah, it was like, well, there was a lot of reasons to torture him and his family after that. But, um, I mean, his descendants. Um, but, uh, you know, so he was isolated in the United States and he was very freely told stories about the Cultural Revolution mm -hmm. and his experience. And then in like 92 or something, his brother came over and his brother's like, you got to let go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you actually need to do the work of letting go of that mm -hmm. and just stop talking about it. Mm -hmm. And he did. 
Um, and now I can still sometimes get them to talk about it, but it was so intense. You know, I was like in my 20s, early 20s, um, listening to him talk about the Cultural Revolution. I was like, what? You know, um, so I'm interested in that. And also, like, obviously, that some of the, in some ways, because the Cultural Revolution is more recent, we gloss over these earlier eras where they were collected all the all the metal all the weapons and melted it down and then starved everybody for two years and what 50 58 59 um 50 million 40 million people died yeah um, so did you when you were asking historical questions or in other ways did you encounter those earlier those that material oh yeah um yeah, this is something that really caught me off guard about talking to, well, I mean, to be quite frank, uh, like not particularly well-educated um, kind of Chinese people from Hubei province. These weren't people with college degrees. Uh, they didn't even finish high school, um, but their sense of history was like really incredible. Um, and to uh, like the sentiment that they would have been like better off under Chiang Kai-shek was very common. Um, In that region. <laughs> yeah, which kind of blew my mind. Um, yeah, because I mean, you know how kind of education works in China, um, kind of ideology classes and stuff like that. And also the fact of, I mean, I think, you know, a reason that George Xu's brother might be like, you got to move on beyond the Cultural Revolution is because people in mainland China, they kind of did. Like the 20th century was really awful, but like the kind of economic growth and advancement and kind of upward mobility that like, you know, millions of people have seen since uh, the, the Deng Xiaoping era began in the 80s has, I think it's really kind of like softened people's judgments about like what transpired under the early decades of communism. You know, they were like, yeah, that was pretty bad, but you know, we got like Xin Zongguo, the new China, and it's thanks to the, the Gong Chandang, you know, the, the communists that uh, I, you know, drive a Buick now. And my dad um, was like, lived in a, a brick shack. <laughs> And so like, that's, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty, um, I don't know, it, the kind of, it's the economy stupid thing, that line from like the Clinton era, it, like it applies to China in ways that we can't even like imagine. Well, uh, I, in, I will in say this, I'm only gonna say it once because I don't like saying it, but <laughs> if you kill off the aristocracy, whatever that is, whether it's an aristocracy of intelligence or merit or, or you know, mm -hmm. or tyranny. Mm -hmm. um, there's a leveling that happens there. <laughs> People can reemerge, but yeah, I mean, you know, that like the whole like uh, one of the hundred flowers blossom, and like all these intellectuals <laughs> like write suggestions for how to make the country better, and Mao just executes them all. I mean, yeah, wah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so okay, I said it. Um, but tell, so tell me, what I mean, what kind of stories did you encounter? Oh, um, well, I mean, uh, people kind of, I guess, when it comes to the Cultural Revolution specifically, people kind of treat it with kid gloves in Wudang, um, specifically because Wudang is like has a, is a very strange case, right? Because um, in the 1930s, uh, 32, I think, 31. Yeah, 31, there was a battle really close to Wudong on the Yang, in the Yangtze River Valley between the nationalists and the communists and the communists just got absolutely smashed. Um, and so they retreated and went up to Purple Cloud Palace where Xu Ben San turned the whole place into an infirmary um, and kind of like nursed all these communists back to health. And supposedly he taught the, the form Taiyi Yu Xingtran also in that time to Hulong, who was kind of uh, common, the general of the communists at that time. Hulong later went on to become the vice premier of the, the Chinese Communist Party in the 1950s um, into the 60s. And so he um, actively uh, protected Wudong through the Cultural Revolution. Um, if you go and look at, uh, so pretty much every temple from uh, the kind of Purple Cloud Palace uh, up to Nanyan, up to the kind of Golden Summit were spared the torches of the Red Guard. Um, and a part of this, like they kind of proactively wrote like communist propaganda on the sides of the temples, like we support Chairman Mao. And it's still in like massive yellow letters that have been written over a little bit, but you can still totally see them if, if you go to like Purple Cloud and stuff like that. Um, 
So Wudong was actively uh, protected by the highest levels of the Communist Party during uh, the Cultural Revolution, you know, whereas like- You're talking about temples, but what about people? Um, people, uh, no, yeah, it, it, the, the temples were emptied. Um, so in the kind of, Wang Guangda was the kind of president of the Wudong Taoist Association, and he wrote this monograph like Wudong History um, in the 1990s. And in that, he says that by the mid 70s, there were about 20 monastics living on Wudong, whereas at the beginning of the century, there was, he estimates about 1500. Um, so yeah, the temples were emptied, uh, other than like the very oldest people, like Li Cheng Yu, she lived in the temple that uh, we, we trained at Yushu Gong, um, and she was like pushing 100 already when this stuff was going down. Um, yeah, and they, they still like- It's fun to talk to her, hang out. <laughs> Well, she died just before I showed up uh, in Wudong, actually, at the age of 116, 118 or something like that. Uh, a lot of times these Taoists kind of inflate their their age numbers, but I totally yeah. believe her. She, she was a 118 year old, you know. <laughs> sure. um, so, yeah, but her two disciples still live at, at Yushugong, kind of. Um, there's a little tiny Zhang Sanfeng uh, shrine, actually, at the back of Yushugong, really kind of old looking statue there. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, when it comes to the Cultural Revolution um, in Wudong, people they they do kind of avoid the subject actually. Um, and when it comes to Mao himself, everyone always this is I found this like across the board they redirect to his um, military strategy. Mm. Mm -hmm. So you talk about Mao, they're like, oh, his military strategy was great. They don't want to talk about anything else. But you know, you can't deny that he was like a pretty brilliant tactician. <laughs> so so yeah. Um, yeah, you could, but <laughs> tactician isn't the right word. We're ruthless tactician. How about yeah. that? Sounds good. Um, <laughs> so, so, and 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 the starvation before that, before the Cultural Revolution, the the the, the melting down of of bells, and did you did you hear any stuff about that? No. No, I never heard about much of the Great Leap Forward stuff. Um, I got the impression that, well, so like my own master, he said he ate nothing but sweet potato until he was seven years old. Um, so only, and like to this day, if he sees a sweet potato, he starts getting like basically like an anxiety attack. Like <laughs> he's just like, they like, he just can't, can't do sweet potatoes. So if master Yuan is ever around you, don't order sweet potato. Um, he'll thank you for it. Um, so, but he was born in 1971. Um, so he kind of missed the Great Leap Forward stuff. I think maybe that's that's a part of it. Like the the people I was hanging out with was Sifu, his wife and her sisters. They weren't there for, for the Great Leap Forward. Um, mm. And the older generation, they're very tight lipped, especially around foreigners. So like Sifu's parents and stuff like that. I hung out with Sifu's aunts and uncles one time. Mm. They don't they don't want to talk about this stuff. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I heard very little about Great Leap Forward. Um, and there was just, yeah, that, the sweet potato thing with Sifu. But like he was from he, like a small fishing village in Southern, uh, like South of Wuhan. Mm -hmm. um, and like, it's been like a very, very poor, very medieval place. So like, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so, he, so he was, his, their family wasn't declared black. What's that? You know, their declarations classes, the, mm -hmm. the worst, the worst class was black. Mm. Meaning, meaning you, you know, <laughs> well, the, the, and, and in Lenin, in Leninist terms, it means you had two windows, not just one. Oh, okay. Uh, so yeah. He was, he was definitely a no window family. Yeah. Um, yeah. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, but, but when you, when you read about that stuff, it's just like, you know, oh, uh, well, I mean, it's the Chen style. So we can talk a little bit about Tai Chi again and, and Jutsu Feng. The Chen style lineage, you know, like the two, the two, the, there were three sons and two daughters, I think of, uh, I might get this wrong, but of uh, um, Chen Fa Ke, um, mm. went mm -hmm. from Chen village to Beijing in sometime around 1930, something like that. Um, and, uh, and, I think the two, definitely the oldest son was executed as a landlord 
Um, hmm. Not because he was ever wealthy, but because his father was sending him money saying, buy a property. Hmm. You know? So he was a landlord. Um, yeah. so they shot him, right? Right. Then in 1950 or whatever, shot him in the back hmm. of the head. Wow. Um, and then I think the other son too, I, uh, second son, the third son was a lot younger. Um, and uh, he didn't want to go to Chen Village as a story. And they, his, they sent his, he sent his own son there and mm -hmm. he was then accused of rape and imprisoned for a long time. So oh. like the lineages that come out of Chen Village are really kind of, dastardly criminal village you know village uh -huh. of culture i know i shouldn't say that but i'm saying it <laughs> um and and so you know that they're not they're not really linked directly to what was the the original lineage of course mm -hmm. we don't know how many lineages there were but they they make the, a claim um, mm -hmm. but it's not uh it's not direct um mm -hmm. And uh, of course, those women, I don't know if they taught at all, they may have taught, would have made sense to teach the women because they'd have a better chance of keeping it a secret. Mm. Um, I've seen some videos of them, they look pretty great. Mm. But um, let's talk a little bit about that. Just, I guess you got a chance to talk to Daniel about my theories and going back to Chi Guan and uh, I don't know how many of my listeners have heard everything I have to say that's in my in my book I can well it's half of it is in the journal of Dao studies and then I, I added more to, in the in this book cool yeah yeah I, I would be curious to hear a, a kind of like um, quick elucidation of that that linkage between the kind of cult of Jiang Feng and Chi Guang yeah so well I mean I I, you you several times here used a Republican era, um, we'll call it a meme, of mm -hmm. discussing John Sun Fung as a historic character. Mm -hmm. And I think that's entirely anachronistic. I mean, mm -hmm. that's not, I don't think that conversation would have had any meaning to anybody in yeah. history until, until they were trying to get rid of the connection between John Sun mm -hmm. and Tai Chi. Mm -hmm. if anybody cared about the historic Jensen Fung. There is, and when they started looking at it, there is that one really interesting question about why was the Ming emperor looking for Jensen Fung? Mm -hmm. and, and then the theory that he was actually looking for um, because he had deposed the previous yeah. emperor and he was a child and he was looking for him. And, mm -hmm. you know, he was supposedly hidden on Mount Wudong, so it was an excuse to search Mount Wudong. That is a very interesting historic step thing and people have commented on, but I don't think other than that purely political question, there mm -hmm. was any notion that John Sun Fung was some kind of historic person, other than you would say that about all the gods. I mean, mm -hmm. Nja was a historic person, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, uh, uh, John Wu was very possibly a historic person, um, maybe less, the higher in the Taoist hierarchy you go, the less biography you have, basically. So Yeah, yeah, the more fantastical it gets, yeah. Well, again, calling it fantasy is different than recognizing that, that you know, the, the three pure ones are specifically do not have biographies. Mm -hmm. Until you get to the Ming and then they start writing stories, like, you know, giving a story background to the, the Jade Emperor you know, mm -hmm. as a, you know, fighting the monkey king or whatever, you know, but yeah, that's yeah. clearly in the realm of something else. It's outside of Taoism, as it were. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's not quite right. It's, outside of Taoism. It's, a, it's a special case where there are, for fun, yeah. they're making mm -hmm. a biography. Mm -hmm. um, you wouldn't, yeah, you still wouldn't, acknowledge a real biography um and in fact john Wu's biography is like you know you have you seen any of there's there's two versions of it there's the the uh the journey to the north um the translation of that that a social history or whatever that i love that yeah yeah that's uh uh, uh seaman gary seaman yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Great introduction too. But, yeah. um, but the, uh, but there's actually, a, according to, to uh, uh, Hannibal Tau, the, the actual murals of John Wu are from a different story. And uh, it's up there on the, on, on CTEX. I forget what it's called, but is a lot more similar to the life of the Buddha. But mm. In that, since you've read that, you know you know he has what um, he has seventy two rebirths, I think, and then he has thirty six adventures after that, after his final rebirth. You know, so it's one hundred eight all the way through, um, some like approximately. Mm-hmm. Um, and but there's that, you know, he just keeps being reborn, 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 mm-hmm. um, because he just didn't make it, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, where am I going with all this? Uh, I have this. Oh, anyway, the point about Johnson Fung is that I, I think he was always um, a, a mythical character. He was meant to be a mythical character. He was treated mm-hmm. as a mythical character. And if you said, you know, I just had a meeting with Johnson Fung, you know, there's a reason. Well, that's why I'm pregnant, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> or, you know, or that's why that's why my garden is growing so much better than yours you know? or <laughs> yeah. what, you know, like so many different possibilities for why you mm-hmm. met with Johnson Fung, mm-hmm. um, you know, so, all right, that's that. And I think that that's really important because during the Republican era, they're trying to separate Tai Chi from the Johnson Fung story. Mm-hmm. All the first Tai Chi people to write about it said it come, came from Johnson Fung and the earliest versions of the classics that we have the five tai chi classics although now there's mm-hmm. more um uh three of them are associated with john Safong. the other one i argued is is from garuda is it, mm-hmm. the, the, the the lineage of you uh what's how do you say that uh you wu xiang you wu xiang no yeah. not you wu xiang no, that's the real person uh Oh, I have to find the tension class. I now I forgot his name, but anyway, that's it's it's um uh, spear guy from the Song Dynasty who had the tattoos. Um, U- UFA. Um, UFA, right? Yeah. The 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 name is is meant to be like so means like lineage of UFA. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, um, yeah. And UFA is actually Garuda. It's a it's a he's a rebirth. Like the bird? Yeah, he's one of the rebirths of Garuda. Oh, cool. Yeah, so huh. that, that, again, it's that, that thing. It's like, well, yes, there was a real person. And there were, that, there's, we definitely know there was a real person. We have a lot of documents about that. But mainly, like 90, probably 8% of people knew about him from plays because he's in a lot of different plays. Mm-hmm. And he, he's, he's an incarnation of Garuda. Yeah. So... Uh, all right, so Johnson Fung, so who is he? Like, all right, so, so uh, I think very early on, he is known as a practitioner of the golden elixir, mm-hmm. right? That, that, that's, that he's associated with that. Yeah. And then, so Chi Chi Guan, who, who is Chi Chi Guan? Um, Chi Chi Guan is a, is a, um, a lineage, um, Marshal uh, general, like his father was a marshal general. Um, it's from a family of generals uh, or officers of some kind, and he's up there fighting the Mongols, and he's super smart about strategy. Comes up with some new ideas. He's really a reformer. He wants to change things, right? Mm-hmm. So of course, whenever you want to change things, you're likely to get in trouble. So. They're like, oh, you're so smart. Let's send you down to Fujian and you can fight those 40,000 pirates and the Wukong or whatever, Wukong, you know, the, the Japanese, whatever this mix of, you know, this land between, between uh, uh, Okinawa and Fujian, right? Yeah. This plant, this water is like yeah. occupied by this other country that's like on water, basically. Yeah. Yeah, um, and they're really good at fighting. They have guns. Mm-hmm. They have, you know, um, they have some really good swords. 
Um, they have tactic, they have tactics based on boats and beaches and, um, you know, they know. So he shows up there and they're just, yeah, everybody who's been down there fighting is just losing. Mm -hmm. And he shows up there and he starts trying to figure out what to do. Right. And one of the people he meets is uh, Lin Zhao An, who is, um, Lin Zhao An is a, uh, starts out as a kind of, you know, teacher of the classics, who's just disillusioned at, at, at some level and, and starts meeting with Jun Sun Feng at night um, and learning the golden elixir. And later he, he, he studies Buddhism extensively too. And he, so he starts teaching this mix of Buddhism, Confucian, Taoism, whatever we want to call it. Um, and he calls it um, San Jiao, the three teachings. Mm -hmm. That's the name of his religion. And there temp he starts opening up all these temples and, um, and he's right in that region. And so he's a, he's a gentry, you know, he, he has, he has Guanxi like mm -hmm. over Fujian, like, um, and so um, he, but he's a really eccentric character <laughs> doing all, all, he's teaching people all the spirit writing stuff too. And he's teaching, he's really popularizing the golden elixir. You know, he's really teaching it broadly. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he, at one point, he becomes an incarnation of Buddha. I mean, he's just, he just wow. doesn't stop. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, but he, he makes this talisman um, called the Zhang, like, like correct, upright, um, qi, talisman. And he's using it for all kinds of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. You know, basically in the battle against pirates. Mm -hmm. um, and he, well, he's or one of the main things he's doing socially is he's organizing to clear corpses because there's all this fighting. And then if in people, when the fighting's happening, you're trying to fortify yourself. You know, if you're not fighting, even probably when you are, um, and, and, uh, um, and then you go out afterwards and you clear corpses, but like, it needed a lot of social organization. It wasn't a cheap thing to do. To, and you had to, and then they were building these thun, you know, um, shrines to the battlefield mm -hmm. dead. So these are thunder god shrines. Mm -hmm. And there's even a story like the pirates came right through his village and they're like, oh, you're Lin Joan, we'll leave you. Because actually, if you leave corpses out, everybody gets, um, it's worse than battlefield. Everybody gets plague. Yeah. For this. So, the, even the pirates respect him. They're like, okay, cool. So mm -hmm. he meets Johnson. Johnson Feng shows up. He sees this social organization. He's like, who are you? He's like, I'll help you, whatever you need. If you can fight these people, whatever. So he's basically Johnson Feng's friend and backer. Mm -hmm. And no, sorry, not Johnson Feng. Chi Ji Wan's friend and backer. And Chi Ji Wan starts trying to reform the you know, adds a lot of Kung Fu, basically. We don't, he adds some, some, his main innovation is like this strategy with shields and spears, long spears, and then a, a, a distractor weapon. So mm -hmm. like, uh, which originally was just a branch with a bunch of leaves on the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's like charge in and like, you can beat these guys with their really sharp swords on the beach. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so he says, um, but then um, Chi Chi Guang gets sick. I don't know what his sickness was, but he was on his deathbed. And Lin Jiao comes and uses his talisman, uh, his, his Zheng Chi talisman, mm -hmm. and teaches him the golden elixir. And Chi Chi Guang is healed and becomes mm -hmm. a lifelong student. Uh, he, they have, there's a letter, there's a correspondence between them for the rest of his life. Cool. Um, and at this period, right, so he's obviously, like, that's his connection to Zhang Feng. Like, he's studying with someone who said he studied directly with Zhang Feng. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, and that, that history wasn't that hard to figure out. <laughs> Just nobody was looking. That's yeah, yeah. my statement. Nobody was looking. Wow. Um, and then to, you know, or where to take it from there, um, Chi Chi Guan writes this piece, like writes this book, and in the first version of it includes this poem, which is a rhyming poem, by the way, um, that has, I uh, forgot the number, but almost like 28 of the named Tai Chi movements. Mm. 
Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. It's a lot of them. And maybe it's only 18. It's a lot. Uh, <laughs> it's like, it's pretty clear that he, and he was saying, you know, this is a thing you do, you know, yeah. that, that my, they do it. He, he goes back and forth, but it's unarmed combat practice of some kind. Hmm. Um, and so, so, uh, so he's sometimes credited as the creator of Taiji, but people will argue about it, right? But I'm like, well, yeah, but it's, we say it came from Zhang Zongfeng. Did he, in the book, he does not credit Zhang Zongfeng, it's true, but he mm -hmm. was a kind of disciple. And, and, uh, and this connection between, I could go into it more, but the connection between the golden elixir and Taiji is also extremely strong. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's the, um, what, what else? Um, the other thing to know about Lin Zhaan is that this thing he's cultivating, this religion, this spreads to every major city in China. I mean, mm. it spreads. There are temples everywhere. Wow. And then at, it, toward the end of the Ming Dynasty, there's like, it's banned. Mm -hmm. Because it's gotten too powerful. That's, they always do this. They're just banned. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so they ban it. They shut all the temples, like, Except in Fujian, they managed to keep them open because hmm. I don't know, you know, bribe the public officials, you know, they had so, but they cut down from like where they were. They cut way, 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 way down to so his influence. And he's yeah. dead at this point, but his, or he's an immortal at this point. But, um, you know, his influence is less, mm -hmm. um, substantially less. But you can see how that also was a, there was a major dialogue about the potency of the golden elixir, you know. And it's threat, right? We don't have mm -hmm. it necessarily mm -hmm. tied directly to martial arts being performed. But Johnson Fung was on the altar, right? Along with Lu Dong Bin on his, his basic mm -hmm. altar as the mm -hmm. martial deity, right? So again, and that, there's more there. There's way more research people can do on this stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't have the skills, um, but it can be done. Um, Very cool. There's the other link, the other big link is that I asked the question from the other direction. I said, hey, I think this is, I, I look at Chen style Tai Chi and I'm like, this is mine, right? This is definitely, this is putting on your hat, combing your beard, tying your belt. I mean, this is mine. So, mm -hmm. so what's the connection to theater? What I ideally, what we want is a play written in the end of the Ming Dynasty, that features Zhang Sun Feng fighting. Mm -hmm. like, that would disprove all of everything else everybody has said about it. Like, we just mm -hmm. wipe the map clean, and you'd have to acknowledge that this thing was there. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, you know, I just was like, you know, fine, like, look at reading books, reading all the footnotes, Googling around. I found it. Um, <laughs> Um, Xi Yangji is the, not the full name, but it's like Journey to the West in the Boat. And it's a story about San Bao, uh, who was um, uh, Zheng He, Zheng mm -hmm. He the, the guy who supposedly took these treasure ships. And by the way, yeah. this book was, you know, the source of the claim that those treasure ships were gigantic. Mm -hmm. um, which turns out to probably be false. No, no, <laughs> no <laughs> shipbuilder believes it. Um, <laughs> But uh, but that and 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 that was com it was, the book was actually commented on by Lu Shun saying you know nobody should ever read this book again, kind of huh. yeah Lu Shun was like <laughs> good guy bad guy good guy bad guy he's <laughs> or just famous literary person people who don't know most famous literary person in in twentieth century early twentieth century mm -hmm. so yeah so Lin Zhao uh, where am I uh, so I found this play. And the three center chapters are about Zhang Sun Feng. Hmm. And there's first one is a dialogue about violence between him and the Buddha. You know, how are we gonna, how can we fight if we don't believe in fighting? Yeah, you know? yeah. And then this, and then the second one is like him visiting the middle chapter, the absolute middle chapter of the whole book is it's like hundred chapters, it's like 57, I think. Somewhere. Hmm. Um, he's, uh, he goes to the capital um, to to talk to the the emperor who is the who is an incarnation of Xuan Wu, but doesn't know it. Yeah. And uh, 
and he falls asleep. Um, he's going, he has a friend who's a secretary there. So Chan Zafeng has his friend who's a secretary and he's gonna get him in to see the emperor, but he gets there too late at night. So he falls asleep and starts snoring. And he snores so loud, it's like an earthquake. So all the, the 24 pilots guards come and they're like, oh, this poor guy is falling asleep. It's, and it's his snoring. They're like, they're like, what? It's his snoring. We thought it was an earthquake. You know, like, and they're like, oh, this guy looks terrible. They, they have all this dialogue about what he looks like. It's clearly improvised. He would just make mm -hmm. jokes about what he looks like. And then, and then they, just, they, can't, they try to pick him up. Like two of them try to pick him up. Then four, then eight, then six, and 16. They're like, hmm. yeah, move this guy. He's got maximum heavy power, right? Or something like that. But they're like, now, then they get mad at him and they take the door beam and they hit him in the head. Hmm. Um, and John Sung Fung like wakes up and flicks it with one finger like 10 Lee. <laughs> right. And yeah. then they all start fighting him. And we don't know exactly what the fight looks like, but the techniques they use are the same or very close to the list used it's interesting that it's not the same it's huh. close to the list Qi Guan used wow um, cool. and there are other unique ones in there that are in the tai chi form that aren't in the other and that there's and there are others that are similar but like that, that list of yeah. moves and they all end up in a pile at the end this is uh -huh. <laughs> <a> snap again <laughs> so. wow Cool, man. And that, that's from like the early 17th century or? No, that's uh, the publication. Of course, the argument I make in the book is that um, it's a, uh, these, are, were, these were workshopped probably over 20 years. And mm -hmm. that many of the stories are actually collected from other sources and then just slightly rewritten. Yeah. So they fit together. That was the, that was the mode of mm -hmm. writing these long 100 chapter epics. So uh, and we know that, like, that's actually been studied. You can you can see that this was pulled from this, this was pulled from that. So, yeah. that. so, um, so we don't know when it was written, and it's anonymous. Mm -hmm. But the 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 inscription, the the introduction, is signed, mm -hmm. um, and it was from 1597. Oh wow, man, that's really what what a cool find, Scott. I know it was just so exciting. I wish everybody would read my book. Anyway, I'm supposed to be interviewing you, but I, I did want to kind of get your take on all of that and anything you have to say on it. But it's fun to lay it out. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, no, I, I think that you're you're gesturing to one of the, a major kind of uh, error that people make in trying to engage with these kind of mercurial figures like Zhang Sanfeng. Um, is that like is he an historical figure or is he not an historical figure? That question makes perfect sense to us in coming from our own kind of like basically Protestant historiographical tradition with this long history of biblical criticism that dates back 400 years. But in China, mm, they didn't start thinking in those terms until like you develop basically communist historiography in the kind of early 20th century. Um, so uh, he's neither a historical nor a non-historical figure. Like it's, it's, a, it's a category error. They, they simply don't map on to the kind of Chinese historiographical imagination pre uh, kind of Republican era, um, I, would, I would argue. Um, and especially with a character like Zhang Sanfeng, who is like quintessentially a trickster figure. Um, and it, I mean, his name, like Zhang, like very generic Chinese uh, Xingming, you know, and then Sanfeng, is the the hexagrams for uh, you know heaven and earth, and his whole thing it's about this, this kind of like interplay of yin and yang, and the sort of topsy turvy nature of of a uh, you know reality and and illusion. Um, it's like in his name. Um, <laughs> so oh, it gets so, worse yeah. because it can be it could be like San Feng can mean like the three peaks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the yeah the three peaks or the three crazy which then has the kind of esoteric, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, Feng can be peak or, or, or it can be crazy. And those are two different characters with the same pronunciation, I think. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah, like, like, yeah, you can eat, you even have multiple Fungs. Um, and so. the three P in, 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 in uh, but there's a the sex, sex it's, there's a sex connection too. He's the god of sex, yeah. basically. Yeah. The, the, so, the three peaks are the, the lips, the nipples and the vagina. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's um, a number of uh, translations in Douglas Wilde's Art of the Bedchamber, yes. right, uh, yeah. uh, from uh, this this sexological Jiangsan Feng. Um, 
yeah uh so yeah to to approach it with like this like very uh kind of like naive uh protestant framework where we're like trying to excavate the historical jung san fung the way that people are like trying to excavate the historical jesus through like the jesus seminars and stuff like that um which i think is a kind of fruitless task um it's even more fruitless in the case of someone like jung san fung uh so yeah, it requires something much more sophisticated, which I think is kind of what you're doing, Scott, a sort of uh, kind of mythological, theatrical kind of like hermeneutics um, where we're taking a lot more kind of data into consideration. Because if we're just looking at strictly historical data, we're limited to like a couple lines from a couple inscriptions and you end up with a really impoverished, impoverished to the point of being completely false actually, depiction of what's even going on with this character. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, it's so it's it's so it's so exciting to me actually that Wudong like had like you got to just go to Wudong and study in the school of Jan Sun Fang, you know mm -hmm. it's like it's like that that it's so potent you know that they were able to recreate something. Yeah, do you have a sense of that like? where um, you are and all that <laughs> yeah it's that's a weird thing like because so for example in in wudang there's like two main sects now there's like the sanfeng pai and the shuan wu pai um and the shuan wu pai it's actually a much more clear cut because like wang guang the head of the head of the wudang dao association he uh re-established shuan wu pai on september 9th 1989 so it didn't exist and then it existed um, whereas with the Sanfeng Pai, you know, true to form for this Jiang Sanfeng character, it's much more fuzzy because like I explained to you the kind of this weird um, lineage triangle thing that happened. Uh, and then there's this character Xiao Yao Wan, who was a Wudang guy who um, preserved this a local Wudang Sanfeng lineage that then um, Wang Guangde got that from him and then gave that to our Grandmaster Zhong Yunlong. Um, but that like the actual content of that lineage it wasn't like our Kung Fu didn't come from there. It, like the, the stuff that came from this, this native Wudang Sanfeng tradition was the Xinfa, the, the kind of heart methods and some kind of alchemical stuff. And um, and uh, yeah, like when, when I look at um, our lineage and I really kind of, I try and tease apart what came from where, it seems like the native, this Wudang lineage is really uh, alchemical. Um, it's alchemy and it's caves. Um, they're very, very into caves and they're very specific, uh, have a, a quite unique vision of like golden elixir stuff that I've never encountered um, such a strict interpretation elsewhere. Um, Cause like Sifu always maintained, like the grand master, he was in a cave when, when I showed up in Wudang um, and he kind of came out and then started a school, but he, he did five years in this cave on Five Dragons Mountain. Um, and my Sifu was like, yeah, I'm eventually gonna live in the cave. And Zhong Yunlong's teacher, Guo Gao Yi, spent his last 10 years in a cave on Zhou San. Um, so the cave thing appears to go go back through the generations, um, and there's this idea that like if you're doing alchemical practice, you're not doing anything else. So like martial arts is not alchemy. If you're doing martial arts, there's nothing nothing alchemical about that. You can use alchemical language to talk about things, but you're not actually doing that alchemy. Same with qigong. It's not qigong and alchemy are fundamentally separate domains. Um, so like alchemy is like sitting in a cave doing nothing but the cultivation of the elixir through your kind of seated meditative and seated and uh, sleeping practices and stuff like that, which there's also a really robust sleeping uh, nadon kind of uh, lineage th th through what we do that ostensibly goes back to Chen Tuan, uh, you know, the sleeping master from the, the Song dynasty. There's a really cool statue of him at uh, Nanyan where he's like sleeping and there's like a dragon intertwined through him. And I think that dates back like to the Yuan dynasty or something. It's a really cool statue. Um, so yeah, um, I'm not. I'm not sure what the hell I was even answering there. Um, but no, uh, <laughs> that was good. That was a lot. That's a lot of interesting stuff. Well, I, I was. I was just asking about your your sense of what it means to be part of the John Sun Fung lineage. Oh yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, like you said, so Wudong, it attracts pretty eccentric people. We met a lot of really crazy dudes out there. I'm not sure how, how much Theo's told you about the kind of sociology of the space, but it's pretty wild. So to this day, you still have people who were like, I was taking a walk in the mountains and I saw Jiang Sanfeng wandering around. Um, 
Like that thing, that sort of thing still happens. Like, is this person? He sends me text sometimes. And, you know, it's bizarre. What? Yeah, he sends me text on the phone. Oh, <laughs> well, there yeah. you go, man. Yeah. yeah. I, I get, I'm like, I'm puzzling something out and something I get a text. Yeah. What, what does he talk about, man? Well, it's usually a little bit cryptic. Mm, yeah. Something about the way that Shun mm. interact with Jing, you know, these yeah. kinds of things. But you never know. I mean, he taught me about reversing the reverse route. Mm. You know, the whole mm. idea of rooting that I should just completely reverse it and <laughs> create an anti-root. Cool, man. I dig it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I, it's it's a it's a it's a good um, <laughs> it's a, it's good to have alternative sources. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I'm sure you've read the that um, the kind of uh, on the authenticity of the cult of Jiang San Feng from the 70s. There's two books, yeah, actually. Yeah. Yeah, one yeah, yeah. Like and dissertation ones are like a. In the beginning, he says that like um, there was some. He has some footnote that talks about how at the beginning of the 20th century, someone counted like 19 different Jiang San Feng lineages in in Taoism. Um, so it's like it's a whole genre, uh, hmm. and I think just yeah, it's important to keep that in mind. Um, in Wudang, like there were lots of Jiang San Feng lineages. And within our own lineage, supposedly, uh, it was like Zhang Zanfeng had uh, eight main disciples who then became the heads of the eight main temples in Wudang. And so each of the temples, Yushugong, Zishagong, Nanya, whatever, uh, transmitted their own kind of like form of Zhang Zanfeng-ish uh, Taoism. So that, that's the kind of uh, emic uh, mytho history. Um, and one of his disciples, Cho Tzu Ji, this is where it gets really interesting, I think, because Cho Tzu Ji is an unimpeachably historical figure. Um, who was kind of like brought to uh, Beijing, the Bayun Guan, the, the White Cloud Temple, to be kind of like head minister minister of state, state, state sacrifices. There was a big statue of him at Bayun Guan that kind of what, disappeared. What year? What year were we talking? Um, he was uh, so post um, Jiang San Feng, so late fifteenth, early sixteenth century. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. And he came back to Wudong to Five Dragons Temple, where he was buried, and they still have his grave out there and stuff. Um, and he supposedly studied under Jiang Sanfeng. So <laughs> again, it's it's like a historical figure, kind of yeah, like your um, Li Li Zhao En was that his name? Yeah. Li Zhao En. Yeah. yeah. Zhao. Yeah. It, Zhao En. Zhao An. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find the, these hinge joints where a like unimpeachably historical figure meets our kind of like quasi historical madman, uh, really fascinating, because um, like, what's going on there? Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just to just to um, well, just to push back on everybody on Mount Wudong, um, uh, the uh, with the dis the like Lin Zhaoan is not the only um, not the only like popularization of Golden Elixir, like it's going mm -hmm. on all over the place, mm -hmm. and it's it's. Uh, for instance, there's this entire form of literature called Baojuan, the treasure texts or treasure volumes. Mm -hmm. um, that, and I, you know, there's, uh, I've told the library in Taiwan has like 500 of them. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, there's a couple books that make attempts at translating bits of them. And they're all different. There are many different types, but it was a, it was a type of ritual literature where you did a short ritual with incense and offerings before you opened it and then you read it usually mm -hmm. to an audience. Mm -hmm. so, it was a, so it was kind of instant cult, mm -hmm. I'd say. And um, golden elixir teachings are extremely common in mm -hmm. that. And those Baojuan are, um, are ubiquitous in the rebellions in like every rebellion. Like not every rebellion, but if you just go and look at the different rebel rebellions, they they very often had a Baojuan that was, or many Baojuan that were part of the the way they proliferated that what they were doing, and mm -hmm. so you know, because martial skills wasn't a distinct category for the, we can talk about it, the ways in which it might have been, but for the most part, it wasn't. It was like we're going to do this thing. We're empowered by these gods or by this, 
this transcendent force or this or this transcendent narrative right if you're if your plan is to kill people and then return to the unborn mother mm -hmm. um, right and that that they built into these cosmologies which were often very cryptic um teachings about the golden elixir mm -hmm. but their goal often was fighting mm -hmm. right so the this myth and there's even a there's even a rebellion called the Chidan rebellion huh golden elixir i don't know about that one yeah cool. Yeah, it was in the north there. Well, it kind of got overshadowed. There's so many rebellions, you know, you yeah. need to lose that one. But <laughs> um, it, it's like there. So that that if you if we're talking about the my you know cultural wide phenomena, the association of the golden elixir with fighting, um, mm -hmm. in in the religious what we might call that overt religious sphere that is not declaratively Buddhist Taoist mm -hmm. or something else. Um, it is something else. Um, and at the same time, in theater, it's an absolutely a trope that if you want someone to be able to fight, you empower them with the golden elixir. Mm. So, so um, you know, uh, uh, Nujia's father, Li Jing, is the cultivator of golden elixir. That's why he's such a great general, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, Nujia, after losing his body, you know, um, Tai Yi, right, Tai Yi, uh, who, who's become embodied, right, Tai Yi is actually like a concept in Taoism, mm -hmm. like great unity, but it's mm -hmm. actually a deity as well who comes down in, this, in the story of Feng Shen Yan Yi, and mm -hmm. comes down and he says, you know, it gives him a new body made out of lotus flowers, which is a, another name for the golden elixir, like mm -hmm. uh, Lin Hua, Lin Hua Dan is also is another name for it. The, mm -hmm. the, the, the flower elixir, the, gold, the, like the, the lotus flower elixir. Um, and, and, uh, and then give, and actually gives him some golden elixir of his own in order to hold all the, you know, the flowers together. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's his new body. By the way, I have, I have my weapons. Oh, nice man. Thundering. <laughs> And then a wind fire wheel here. Cool. Wow. That's part of my new show. Yeah, uh, Daniel told me about your your Nuja theory of like the, the giant Bagua Dao. So you make someone look like a little baby. <laughs> that's that's genius, man. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Um, I mean, I think it's just like so obvious once you see it. <laughs> you can't see it. Oh yeah, um, totally. But uh so anyway, uh um it's like it I mean it's it's like, you know, in, in a movie, when you want someone to learn how to fight or become a better fighter, like Rocky just sitting in the bag and jogging, jump rope, it's a 20 second montage, now you can fight, right? Yeah. So we, do it, we do it all the time. And mm -hmm. in Chinese theater, you just gave them an elixir pill and, mm -hmm. you know, or some bird, or sometimes you give them a book, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is obviously the dream of every, you know, boy who's being forced to study, like, why can't I read something that can make me fight, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> so my my point and my sort of response to the that Wudong orthodoxy, we might call it orthodoxy in the cave, mm -hmm. such a thing, um, <laughs> is uh is that uh, it it was a, a widespread cultural phenomenon to associate mm -hmm. the golden elixir with great fighting skill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the sense I got from Sifu, like the maybe you might, again, we're talking about this, the cave orthodox perspective, um, is that like this had this was like the core of the alchemical tradition was this like on a mountain in a cave by yourself doing your thing, and that the language had been kind of appropriated by different domains um, without them really like understanding what was going on. That was that was the kind of perspective that was. Uh, presented in Budong, which I, yeah, I found really interesting because in Western, certainly in Western popular understandings of Nadon and stuff, it's basically like uh, Qigong, Nadon, they're kind of like the same thing, you know, uh, it's like, oh yeah, you're just moving stuff through the meridians and uh, kind of uh, enlightenment by way of plumbing, as, as Daniel put it. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it, I just found that fundamental disjunction really interesting in the kind of, in the stuff in Wudong. 
And I think uh, both Zhu Changda and Guo Gao Yi were really uh, into that view where it's like something totally separate. Um, and I've seen it in some texts and stuff. And yeah, I mean, like the language of alchemy is extremely abstruse and it probably had very like high class connotations throughout most of Chinese history. Um, so I could see, uh, you know, kind of like how people depict like Yang style and kind of aspirations of being higher class uh, being woven into kind of the developments of the martialists. Yeah, I mean, these basically these kind of like Marxist uh, classist uh, analyses of uh, the kind of function of these different discourses. Mm. So, so yeah, I suppose in doing this, like saying that um, different classes appropriate alchemical discourse, that's a kind of like Marxist analysis. Um, and you can kind of take that as you will. Um, yeah. Okay, I would unravel that a couple different ways. One way is really complex, so, um, but I'll do it because it's fun. Um, cool. But the other, let's just see, the other is to say that, um, well, the more contemporary thing we have evidence for is that um, after the Boxer Uprising, like because fighting is so fighting, even possessed fighting, um, uh, all of these gods were associated with the golden elixir. All the mm -hmm. god, the possessing gods were. So the golden elixir got kind of a bad name, and Taoist would had other reasons for historic reasons for doing this. Really tried to scientize it for one. That was oh, yeah. the Taoist movement, right? But also to to separate it out and go no 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 this that's just they appropriated it sure but we don't we don't do that right make that line as thick as you can mm -hmm. to preserve the golden elixir so mm -hmm. it doesn't get banned mm -hmm. right is kind of the that thing and so you you see the like you might say tamer and tamer versions of the golden elixir mm -hmm. um a tame isn't quite the right word refined is probably a better word but regardless, the, the less the wilder end of it is, mm -hmm. uh, is jettisoned, as it were, at least in the popular front mm -hmm. of, of, of culture. And, uh, but I think there's an, a lot of evidence that, um, that, that what happened a lot of times is that you'd have your local sort of militia organization that was just, there's nobody running it, mm -hmm. you know, either whoever had been running it died. And it's just like, you, you need village defense. You have your, you have your defended village with the bandits are just taking advantage. They're ambushing you. It's just, it's a mess. Small numbers of well-armed, you know, ruthless bandits are coming in and terrorizing you. Mm -hmm. And these guys would show up, said, well, we'll, we'll, you've got more people than the bandits. We'll organize you and you go hunt the, we'll, you'll go down and hunt those bandits. We'll mm -hmm. teach you how to be strong. And part of, you know, there were, so the real training Gong Fu, but they were mm -hmm. also using various types of what I would call magic tricks diving here into the anthropology of, of magic, which is its own, it's almost like the magicians in the West created their own anthropology. Mm -hmm. where they're like, that's charlatanism. This is real magic. Mm -hmm. We use science for our magic. You know, it's like they did this, this bizarre thing. But, um, but, you know, they were using magic tricks to demonstrate um, extraordinary martial prowess. Mm -hmm. that then inspired people and the most common version of this is invulnerability tricks yeah mm -hmm. and were extremely widespread and very often mixed you could say with golden elixir practice mm -hmm. so <laughs> you can interrupt me anytime but the mm -hmm. earlier explanation is um is that what you have at Mount Wudong comes out of um, 
Tang Dynasty or uh, earlier than Tang, actually a little bit, um, uh, um, Shangjing practices, which you know is combining possibly Dzogchen or pre-Dzogchen kind of practices from Tibet mm -hmm. um, with you know with what had been very what was developing as very elaborate Taoist ritual, which was then done entirely as visualization practice. Mm -hmm. So there was this, and maybe that's some Buddhist influence, but it since all of that ritual was done with visualization to begin with, mm -hmm. it was a way, so it was already a form of the golden elixir, or always, I think, um, in, in Taoism, all ritual was from the beginning. But it's an opinion, it's a little hard to prove, but it depends on how you define golden elixir, of course. And then mm -hmm. it gets internalized. So you're doing this elaborate ritual as part of your sitting practice, mm -hmm. right? And then it's an easy jump from someone who has that skill set to doing um, a monastic practice where mm -hmm. that is kind of kept secret or simplified. Mm -hmm. um, it's also an easy jump to Dao Yin, to combining that that kind of inspiration, visualized inspiration, and making Dao Yin more and more elaborate and produce some theater. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like my summary. So I think Golden Elixir is deeply ingrained in theatrical training. Mm -hmm. uh, in the same way, it's ingrained in in um, in uh, Chuan Chen Taoism, mm -hmm. but they took a very different direction. Right, one went to expressivity, and the mm -hmm. other went to the cave. Yeah, it's actually yeah. the same base practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that reading. Yeah, yeah, I think Joseph Needham um, as the uh, traces the kind of external to internal alchemy switch to like seven Tong emperors in a row who died of mercury poisoning or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this stuff is tough because you can't. The footnotes are bad, but yeah. Yeah, his footnotes are awful. What's up with that? Uh, otherwise, it's yeah, it's yeah. Anyway, but uh, uh, yeah. Um this internalization of the ritual kind of similar to what people say about like the kind of Upanishadic movement and India and stuff like that. Uh, and that's most interesting as well, because like we, we, I, we train in this very rigorous alchemical tradition and there was almost no visualization whatsoever. Like there was almost nothing is visualized. It's almost entirely like proprioceptive. Um, like you're sitting and basically waiting for something to happen inside your body. Um, and then you kind of, follow that and you're, you're working with very like physical energies in your body um and our sifu had a pretty pretty literal interpretations of what was going on in this stuff like um like jing is like jing and semen are very very they're not like exactly the same thing but they're like pretty close <laughs> um and the feeling the feeling of jing is like what you're starting with um the sort of like a kind of orgasmic phenomenology, you might say, that's produced through certain breathing practices and stuff like this. Um, so, yeah. So, again, it's it's something quite, quite unique that didn't really fit with everything. Because if you read, you know, books about alchemy, um, you read something like the the, the Xingming Bajue or uh, the Huiming Jing or C Carl Jung's little uh, golden uh, flower thing. Uh, there, it's all these, you know, great ecstatic visualizations and so sophisticated um, and aesthetically kind of interesting. And ours was very, um, yeah, very totally different focus. Um, so that, yeah, I don't, I don't really know where that fits uh, either. Um, I haven't been well, able to place I that. I think I do, but it's a, but we, we, I see we would have to like start this over from the very beginning. <laughs> I, got, I, I, got, I think I got to plug in. We're gonna meet up in person, I think. So we should get, we should make that happen. Um, yeah, man. You're in Colorado? Yeah, yeah. Short drive. Yeah. That's my thing lately. I'm like, let's, let's stop playing this. Let's play a new game. Like the Golden Elixir is super important for producing these magic tricks. Mm -hmm. something nobody else is saying mm. and i think it's like you know there are all sorts of other benefits like the magic tricks are just a sidecar but 
if we make the magic tricks the center and we say it's chi and I'm so you know, mm -hmm. great skill, we mm -hmm. just, you know, that's so boring. <laughs> you know, it just disconnect, and I think it's disconnected from history. But mm -hmm. I, I'm actually creating a new moment by saying what's called magic tricks instead of, you know, because nobody believes if we could use a Protestant term, um, nobody believes in the mystical force anymore, really. So mm -hmm. then they just they just get frustrated. Mm -hmm. right? So I'm like, well, let's reframe it as a magic trick, and then say the practice of alchemy is you know you can look at it as science if you want. That's okay. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not the best way to learn it, but yeah, why not? <laughs> look, here's my. Oh, cool, man. The rabbit making the elixir under the tree? In the moon. Oh, in the moon, of course. Yeah, okay. Cool, man. Wow. A tree is the tree of Jing. It mm -hmm. has all its different pronunciation of Jing. Those mm -hmm. are all the classics, mm -hmm. which are, um, you know, the, the um, uh, it's, a, it's, they're purple leaves, each of which is the original the original of all classics ever written or to be written yeah. so that if we ever lose the Tao Te Ching, for instance, mm -hmm. um, we can get it from the moon because there's an original version and it's in a proto language. It's in some kind of language that would have to be translated because language changed with Taoism is always about the science. Mm -hmm. Language isn't consistent or reliable. So if we, or, we might not even lose the Tao Te Ching. We might just not be able to understand it anymore. Then we yeah. have to get, it would automatically be like mm. transmitted from one of these leaves on the moon mm. back to us. That's the, that's the cosmology. But that's a picture of the golden elixir too. So the Jing is there, the Qi, the action of Qi and the mm -hmm. sun surrounding it mm. Right? Mm. as a phenomenon. And you stare, you know, you would stare at the moon in a, in, in a still body of water or a mirror, right? And so that it's outside and inside at the same mm. time, and you merge mm. them, right? Interesting. Hmm. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Not what sure where to take the golden elixir conversation, but I think <laughs> I I wouldn't I wouldn't back away from you trying to define chi and, and shun in, in within the golden elixir, like outside of martial arts do it um yeah um it's just nailed down jing yeah yeah jing is semen end of story <laughs> no uh yeah i mean um these are all categories with extremely uh diverse like internal histories internally diverse histories within the chinese intellectual tradition right chi is so many different things yeah. um absolutely absolutely yeah and shen uh, shen I, I i find it very, very interesting um because it's actually part of this kind of like general epistemic vocabulary that spans the kind of tibeto uh sino-tibetan linguistic family because in in uh, you know tibetan we talk about like sheba like consciousness or yeshe kind of the kind of like primordial consciousness it has this she that um is like certainly etymologically linked to shen and in Chinese, we talk about shen and zhi and shi, and then there's another shi, and there's all these like knowledge and mind-based words that have the same sort of uh, kind of phonetic core to them. And they're all different kinds of shades of mind. Um, and it, so it's, it's really cool to really kind of dive into that. Uh, and it gets so much more sophisticated, right? When, when a kind of Indic philosophy, Sanskrit categories start coming up. And I don't think there's any language that's more like epistemologically sophisticated than Sanskrit. Like it's the kind of hair splitting they do in like Buddhist, like Abhidharma literature and stuff like that is just like unparalleled. Um, and it's estimated that, you know, when, when kind of like this huge importation of uh, really of Buddhism and Indic languages into China uh, kind of in the early centuries of the common era increased the vocabulary of the Chinese language by like 25%. Um, so just like huge influx of new words, new categories and new ways of thinking. Um, so this is, that, your, this is your book. Um, no, not really. My, my book is very Western. My book is focused on the term subtle body, which was coined in England in the 1670s. And then I just trace how it started as a very technical 
kind of Neoplatonic uh, technical term. Uh -huh. And then the semantic range just kind of expands as in like the 19th century Indologists are translating things out of Sanskrit and they're like, oh, this sounds like this subtle body thing from these Cambridge Platonists. And so they slap, paste it onto that. And then theosophists are using uh, Tibetan terminology. And then Carl Jung actually and Richard Wilhelm bring in the kind of Chinese stuff. And so then by the kind of World War II, subtle body so all refers to Neoplatonism, Samkhya, Yoga, Vedanta, uh, Chinese alchemy, um, you know, Tibetan uh, yogas and tantras. Um, and so yeah, I just kind of trace the, how this, this term comes to mean like everything. Um, and I stop in 1970 or so, because after that, it just like explodes in every direction. Um, so that, that's my book. It's very, it's very, it's kind of taking stock of the Western categories we're bringing to bear when we engage with these Eastern concepts. Um, could, could, could we, by any chance, make a dichotomy between subtle body and the muscular body, especially the Christian muscular body? Um, Did you consider that? Is that? Well, uh, yeah. Um, so you can kind of do whatever you want with the subtle body. And I tell the story of, of why that's the case. <laughs> so oh, cool. yeah. um, these sort of juxtapositions, yeah, are kind of, I historicized these kind of things within a, this kind of genealogical narrative. Um, so I can get into like any particular subject and give you an historical proxy for someone who's probably done that sort of thing before. Um, but uh, Well, I, I think people should read the book, including me. Uh -huh. And then I could ask really good questions. It's really expensive. It's a really expensive book. I think they just, uh, they priced it. So it will only be bought by libraries or whatever. Um, so, uh, but my dissertation is free uh, through Google. You can just Google my, my dissertation and download the PDF of that. It's pretty similar to the book. The book has an extra chapter on Aleister Crowley, which is really cool and was tons of fun to write. Um, well, I just say to everybody, tell your library to buy his book. And there you go. My books too, by the way. Um, yeah. And then, um, and then we'll make a lot of money just selling the library. Um, <laughs> so go back to where you were because you're you're you actually were doing this philology philology thing. That's super cool. You speak. Wait, let's, let's just so everyone knows. Sanskrit. Do you speak any other Indic language? My Sanskrit's really basic. Read, read, um, read. familiarity. Okay, but you have some Sanskrit. Yeah. 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 Do you, um, do you have? Did you? No, no. Just, just uh, like okay, like uh, ancient Greek, Japanese, Sanskrit, Chinese, modern and classical, and Tibetan. Um, and, and I can like read European languages and stuff, you know. French, um, German, Italian, yeah, and, and Spanish. Um, if I really need to. Um, Russian. You got any Russian? No, 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 no Russian. No? Oh my God. Ah, How about you, Scott? Terrible. You got Russian? <laughs> <laughs> language is not my thing <laughs> I, I, I. um but but i uh, well so you know i said it in classical dance so i ended up mm -hmm. um learning a fair amount of sanskrit mm -hmm. um, yeah. and even learning to read it at one point but i i am you know and and my classical chinese is now better than my spoken chinese so <laughs> and neither is particularly good <laughs> But um, it's COVID was good. I got to I got to teach myself a lot of classical Chinese, which was there's a lot of good resources Ooh. now. I mean, it's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. But it's like, so you're doing this philology thing, which is super interesting. And I don't know if you want to. I mean, obviously, Homer and the you know has some relationship to to uh, the Mahabharata. <laughs> right or maybe i mean mm -hmm. ah we, can we do that um at least it's some some origin similarities um because they're both they're both indo-european mm -hmm. um but yeah to talk about what say more about language and, and uh tibetan is a completely separate root right tibetan it's, is burmese it's the same family as as a as chinese um okay. There's like the tibeto burman family that's a subfamily of the sino-tibetan family um so it has the same but yeah tibetan is such a funny case right because uh chinese is like famously kind of a structural 
um, you know, like different parts of speech can things just morph around. And like the only thing that indicates what part of speech something is, is like the word order you're reading it in, especially in classical Chinese. Yeah. So it's very resistant to structure. And so Tibetan is actually part of that same linguistic family. But, you know, when the Tibetans got literacy, they got it really through India. Uh, and so they actually took like Panini and like Sanskrit grammar and tried to paste that on top of Tibetan language. And it just doesn't fit at all. But like to this day, this is the way that Tibetan is taught. Um, so it's just like, <laughs> it's kind of like infuriating. You're trying to put these very like mathematical and sophisticated like Sanskrit um, kind of linguistic categories on top of the Tibetan language that is just like pushing back at every, uh, you know, every place it could. Um, so if, if you're if you love languages for their own sake, then it's a really fun thing to study. Uh, but if you're just trying to learn Tibetan to like maybe read something or other, you will you will not have a good time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's this, the 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 eighty two um, the the eighty two thousand or eighty four sorry eighty four thousand yeah. translation project. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was hanging out with all those people for a while because I, I wrote my first book like at Gomde. Or, uh, the, Yeshe, I forget the whole Tibetan name for it. It's a retreat center in Northern California. Hmm. Uh, and, and so they're all working on this. And, um, and actually, it turns out one of my students is a, he's a Sanskrit poetry guy. Oh, cool. David Mellons. Um, now he's doing something else. But I think he's at the school, Rhode Island School of, of oh, yeah. Design or something. But he was, in, and he was their Sanskrit consultant cool. you know, for that group. Um, mm -hmm. and, and they've been, they're trying to go through all 84,000. It's just this crazy project to translate the entire Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist canon. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't know that that, that that problem was there actually. They, um, <laughs> they're so in Tibetan, you know, they're so. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like once you sink into it, you don't even notice you're like a fish in water, but it was because I had, I had already studied like Sanskrit for a few years and like class I was really well versed in Chinese and stuff like that then when I came to Tibetan I was like wait a minute <laughs> like they're trying to pull something here and it's pretty weird um so it, yeah it was because of my linguistic background that I could see like how I was like this grammar doesn't fit this language like they're trying to they're forcing it you know <laughs> but I mean yeah go ahead well so the philology connecting Tibet I've actually never heard somebody talk about this specific thing although I probably saw it on a chart somewhere like so the term pure knowledge felt mm -hmm. knowledge or whatever how we want to translate that crazy and mm -hmm. important word in Taoism, pure is somehow related to terms from tibetan like they have a sim there's you can find all those same roots oh yeah 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 um for example like yi the kind of yi mind that it rides on horses and it lives in your spleen uh that's a, that's exactly in tibetan yi mind it yid is how you write it in the tibetan Kind of romanization system which is very imperfect but it's just pronounced yi yi and it also rides on horses and it has a lot to do with your lung the kind of energies that flow through your body so they have identical uh kind of epistemic structures um that share really fundamental qualities across the linguistic divide yeah are you comfortable with lung as chi or N uh no no definitely not <laughs> um what? but I'm, yeah i'm like I guess it depends on the situation, like in like uh -huh. a day to day sort of thing. I'm like, yeah, lung chi prana. Okay, we can do it all. But yeah, I mean, you really, when you dig into it, uh, you know, for example, lung is used to translate both prana and vayu from Sanskrit. So already it's like a, a, t a term that doesn't exist. It doesn't have an exact parallel in Sanskrit because prana is prana and vayu vayu uh, in like Sanskrit context. And then, yeah, and then chi, like, yeah, as we kind of established is its own thing with a very long internally diverse history from the way it's used in the kind of earliest Taoist texts, uh, you know, like, like Guanza or Huainanza, and then like Mengzi uses it in a completely different way. And yeah. uh, that's before we're even into the Qin dynasty, right? So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I can get really, really pedantic about this stuff, as you can tell. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah. Well, I'm interested in that. I'm interested in, in, uh, you know, in your sense of, because, well, okay, it seems to me the Tang court, right? There's like 800 members of the Tang royal family and like, you know, 300 of them are practicing some kind of meditation, weird ritual thing, you mm -hmm. know, maybe more like, and they have almost infinite resources, you know, and, you know, they could say, 
they could say to the army, hey, which there's, I heard there's a guy up there. Can you go, you know, bring him down, you know? You know, mm -hmm. so I have this kind of sense that there was, like, that's a kind of key place where these merging was happening. But maybe you, but, but maybe you have a sense that there's a, a philological, you know, it's a language-based argument that takes place outside of time or in some other time or that we can't pin down about how these words are changing is that do i have that right are you, are you talking about specifically the conversation between tibetan and chinese epistemic categories yeah well and also uh you know whatever other language you want to pull in i mean there's they were okay. obviously interacting with thai and you yeah know, right i mean it's not cambodian yeah. they were you know uh whatever language they were yeah i mean yeah the tongue is a really interesting time because it's also right um, with the kind of the expansion of Islam across Central Asia and the Abbasid uh, Caliphate, you know, expands in the eighth century um, and well, seventh and eighth centuries. Yeah, I think it's kind of mid seventh century, a bunch of Manichaean priests kind of migrate um, to Xi'an or Chang'an back then and kind of establish Manichaeism as a religion in China. And I think that had massive repercussions that we haven't really sorted out yet. But um, this kind of the centrality, this focus on light and cultivation of light, and even alchemy itself. Um, there's this one scholar who wrote um, this book, Alchemy as a Way of Salvation, uh, Frederick Spiegelberg. He was a professor at, at a Stanford in the mid 20th century. And he talks about how, how kind of wherever his theory is that alchemy is actually the practical method of the Manichaean religion. Um, and so he says, like, wherever Manichaeism goes, which it began, it began kind of in present day Iraq, and then, you know, went out in both directions into Egypt and into Europe, so on and so forth, um, wherever it goes, alchemy follows. Mm. So he thought that Manichaean priests were kind of the bringers of pretty sophisticated alchemical, like what is essentially inner alchemical methodologies, because they had this vision that um, all of all material reality was made out of like the corpses and blood and like semen and excrement of demons. Um, however, it was all filled with like little particles of light um, that like the divine kind of prince of light uh, sacrificed himself um, at the beginning of time. And so the job of the of the kind of Manichaean uh, priest was to liberate the light particles from the demonic material reality. Mm. Um, and so and bring it together and, in unity. Uh, well, actually, um, to you liberate the light particles, bring them into your body, and then through hymns you sing them out, and they go up to the moon. And through the waxing of the moon, the particles fill up the moon. And then when the moon is full, uh, it begins to dump the light particles back into the sun, which is where they originate. Um, and then the waning of the moon is that all the light particles going to the sun and being transported out. And then you kind of continue the process until all of the light. Is back in the sun, which is the kingdom of light, which is where it all started. Yeah. Um, so, so that came to China <laughs> in the mid uh, seventh century, and then it spread all over the place. Uh, uh, kind of the, the Manichaeans caused some trouble in like the Song Dynasty with kind of stirring up little revolts and out of their vegetarian restaurants based in Fujian and stuff in like the the tenth and eleventh centuries. Um, so. Uh, yeah, the, the, the Tang was this fascinating time of kind of weird intercultural chain, exchange and communication. And then there's the Anlushan Rebellion in 755, followed by essentially a, a century of Uyghur domination of China that's been kind of, people don't really remember this, but like the Tibetans marched into Xi'an and kind of conquered China for like three weeks. And then the Uyghurs basically were the kind of de facto rulers for most of the ninth century. Um, so uh, yeah. Um, that kind of, and the Uyghurs were a Manichaean kingdom. They, they converted to Manichaeism. Um, and so you had the kind of Turkic influence, Tibetan influence uh, mixed in with the Chinese stuff. Um, so it's, it's just, it's really complex actually, these, the kind of first three centuries, well, most of the Tang dynasty actually, um, these kind of intercultural dynamics. And that happens also to be the period out of which inner alchemy was born, right? So um, there are definitely these really interesting foreign influences in this sort of crucible of inner alchemy. Yeah. Well, that was cool. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Um, 
Yeah. So, I mean, the Tang guys, they're fight, there's a lot of wars. They keep continuously fighting with the Tibetans, trying to yeah. keep those four garrisons open, which is that connection to, I guess, you could, the Manichaean homeland, you could say. Mm -hmm. right? But it was also, you know, the Silk Road uh, is what it's called usually. Mm -hmm. uh, the Li Bai, right? The most famous poet is supposed what he was some ethnic mix part turkic or something nobody really knows right mm -hmm. yeah yeah mm -hmm. uh, but he was right in that he was on he was out there in the west um and he was a Taoist priest too he was mm -hmm. he was mm -hmm. you know um highest clarity Taoist priest um so <laughs> <laughs> I, it's interesting you know th there's there's a way to look at Taoism as always um engaging with the ethnic other yeah there's hmm. from in, in almost any period you can look at there's a, there's an attempt to um to uh, integrate you know what's going on or or you know it, it's almost like um uh, all these different ethnic groups that surround China are inspiration. Mm -hmm. and, and you see Miao communities, for instance, and Yao communities convert en masse, become Taoist communities. Um, but you also see, uh, I mean, e even the very early uh, Zhang Daoling, uh, you know, 50 CE, that what's called the ba uh, what it's called it's the commandery it was part of the Han Dynasty originally mm -hmm. um, that was mixed ethnic you know it's Tibetan <laughs> it was, who knows what language they were speaking in fact some of the language stuff that Terry Gleeman's second book it's like it's never been translated they have this language that's written down and nobody actually knows how to translate it <laughs> and that's right where Taoism started right know? yeah yeah they were out in Sichuan and yeah the, the first like dynasty to embrace Taoism was the Wei dynasty. They were the Tuaba. They were Turkic. They weren't they weren't even Han. Um so yeah. There's a depends on your definition of Taoism, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's you, a tough problem, but yeah. You don't uh, think the Wei embraced it? You don't think Coach Andrew and those guys were Taoist? No, I wasn't I I wasn't even commenting on that, but I think that, you know, the Han dynasty you could define as Taoist. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. But it depends on how you want to spin that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a. <laughs> I mean, those tombs, man. You know, <laughs> Ma Wang Dui sure does seem Taoist. I mean, it's all Taoist stuff in there. It's true. Yeah, it's true. But, so, so did you dive into Dunhuang material? That the, the Dunhuang is out there in the West. It's this, all these caves. It's got. It's got images and and texts galore tibetan chinese oh, all yeah. these other languages too um wow do you have a take on that uh yeah yeah i mean i think dunhuang is where our only surviving chinese manichaean texts come from there and two of them are like translated into chinese and one of them is actually a chinese transliteration of like a parthian song like a middle persian uh hymn um so Chinese transliterations of Persian, it gets very interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, the kind of, um, again, you have this like Tao, Buddhist, Manichaean fusion, and they're, they're just like bringing all these categories together. It's this incredible spirit of syncretism in the Manichaean stuff from there. Um, but yeah, I mean, you also have... Uh, Dunhuang, and then there's the uh, Turfan, the Bezeklik caves, and you have kind of, kind of old Uyghur texts and texts in like old Turkic. Um, yeah, it was, uh, there was so much intercultural exchange. I think we have a really, really kind of childish view of like the, the monolithicness of sort of Han continuity through these periods. Um, mm -hmm. The Tang dynasty was very Turkic. Very true. I remember reading about it. it was one of the sons of the Taizong Emperor. I think he was there was like this like it was like Turkomania kind of in like Chang'an at that time. And he like he pitched a like basically a yurt like within the imperial palace 
and uh, like wore a like a dagger at his belt and he would like slice his ham like that and like eat it you know like a like a turk and stuff like that and his dad was boots. by him yeah yeah mm -hmm. so uh yeah um i love dun huang uh i'm not i'm not sure what uh what do you mean about like a take on that I, there's not really any like inner alchemy stuff out there or anything that i've been able to track down um but there are i mean great scholars are sorting through all that stuff right now like sam ben shake and and guys like that you know yeah no it, it's it's a i mean it's a it's a treasure trove it's yeah. the quintessential treasure trove mm -hmm. um no i just thought that was that was a take i i like it i like it. um Wow, no, it's great stuff. Well, we've talked for a long time, um, so so why don't why don't we finish up by oh, you telling me about your yurt and your business, and then we'll have to talk again. I think. Yeah, um, I uh, I live in a yurt. I, my wife and I bought 14 acres in British Columbia, and um, I spent all last year uh, building this year, putting up the deck and everything. And uh, we're, we're totally off grid. That's kind of cool. We have solar panels because um, like actually getting running power lines out here was like just prohibitively expensive. So uh, these days, you know, it's kind of cool. It's, it's actually kind of affordable to go totally off grid solar panels and propane generator and big batteries. Um, and uh, we're, we just teach Kung Fu in this little town called Penticton here in uh, BC. And we're like uh, going to actually like start renting a space this year. COVID has waylaid all of our plans, you know, as with everyone on the planet. So we're finally moving on that. How near are you to the Windsor or the Valhalla's or? I don't know what those are. <laughs> well, oh, no, not Windsor, Whistler. Whistler said. Oh, Whistler. Yeah, that's outside of uh, Vancouver. Um, we're like a we're like four and a half hours from Vancouver, and then Whistler is like a little bit north of it, I think. Um, four and a half hours. Uh, due east. Yeah, oh, we're east. Oh. Yeah. And if you go north from, from you, what are the mountains that you hit? Uh, well, we're actually. I mean, BC is a bunch of like vertical mountain chains. So there's like Vancouver, and then there's the Cascades. Yeah. And then there's Okanagan Valley where we are. And then there's like the Kootenai Mountains over here. And then there's more valleys. And then there's the Rockies. So Rockies, okay. Kootenai's, Cascades. Okay. So, but aren't you in this little area there where like there were all those uh, Mennonite, not Mennonite, it's a separate sect, right? There was like a pacifist sect that like. I've heard of those guys. Yeah. They're um, a few hours from here. Oh, okay. Are they the Seventh Day Adventists or? No, it's like its own thing. You know, it's like it is like I think it was a split off from the. What did I just say? The Mennonites. I think. Mennonite, so. Yeah. But there are tons the, of Mennonites out in uh, in Alberta. They're extreme like, pacifists. They don't even deal with big knives. Yeah. Um, wow. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they're they're actually still up there, and they 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 were all arrested during World War Two. But wow. I think that's the story. But um, <laughs> yeah, I was up there at one point, like long, like many years ago, and like taught martial arts for like a week. <laughs> it was really, really funny and weird. But I can't remember any of the names <laughs> of the town. These these like quasi Mennonites. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it was a mixed town, but the, like many of them knew their own history and had some hmm. association. Had were holding on to the pacifism or. Mm. that kind of thing yeah 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 huh. it, it, cool, it, <laughs> anyway I, that's not where you are that's cool um so you're not that you really aren't that far from me you're just somewhere like i follow one of those freeways up from the north cascades yeah uh, yeah yeah we're we're two hours from the american border um we're in the only desert in canada it's the sort of like northern tip of that desert that kind of stretches up basically from the sonoran through East Oregon, East Washington, and then it kind of has a little terminal point in Canada, and that's where we are. Ah. Interesting. All um, right. Can I see? A, can I see? It? Can you get, give me a tour of the yurt, just like just the, the walls or whatever? Yeah, it's kind of filthy. So this is the loft I built right here. We sleep on top of that, and uh -huh. that's 
roof, which I put a cover in it now because the sun is coming up at like 3.30 in the morning. It's really annoying. And uh, I'm, it's still like under construction. I'm not entirely done with it yet. Um, but uh, Randy's art desk and uh, wood stove that kept us warm through the winter and all my instruments, um, windows and front doors. And uh, yeah, I'll show you the uh, kitchen. That is our kitchen. Um, so yeah, we have like running hot water now and it's like a normal house propane stove. It's um, beautiful, man. That's, that, that's pretty fun. And, and you play tabla, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I studied tablas under this guy uh, back in college. He studied under Zakir Hussain. He spent some time with the Ali Akbar Khan College of Music. Uh, really interesting cat. What's his name? David Courtney. David. Hmm. He's based out um, of Houston. I probably met him. Yeah? I play tabla too. I... Not that much anymore. I've been playing African drums, Ghanaian drums lately. Cool. But uh, but yeah, uh, I studied. I studied with uh, not with Zakir with uh, Swapan Chowdhury. Oh, cool, man. Where, did you study at Ali Akbar Khan College as well? Yeah, yeah. But but um, but I was a student of Chichar's Dots. I was a dancer, so I was I was learning in order. Yeah, yeah. To cool, man. Uh, wow, far so. out. We have that in common. Hey, if you like that video, don't forget to subscribe and watch the other ones. Also, check out my book, Tai Chi, Bagua Zhang, and the Golden Elixir, Internal Martial Arts Before the Boxer Uprising. And you can also find me at northstarmartialarts.com. Thanks.